I'm Marty Kelsey. And I'm Beth Wilson. We're coming to you live from just outside the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Now, today, the National Air and Space Museum is actually celebrating its 40th birthday, and we have opened a new gallery, or renovated a new gallery. And it looks absolutely amazing. The Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall has gone through a three-year renovation, and it looks stunning inside. So what's your favorite artifact in there? I'll tell you what, I, one of the things that I really like about this gallery is that they've, they've gone in and they've taken videos of a lot of the artifacts and placed them near them. So it really puts it in context. So you can see the giant wind, uh, wind tunnel fan in action. Uh -huh. You can see the planes in action, see them in context, and it really, really does a nice job of showing you that these are the real things that set these records that were these amazing artifacts. How about you? Well, the thing I like the most right now is that we have restored the Star Trek Enterprise. Uh, it is out of the gift shop. It is in milestones of hall, uh, the milestones of flight hall, and we've got the lights working on it, and which is really cool. Spin, <laughs> and it's incredibly cool. Um, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of excitement over that coming back on display. It's been in conservation for a while. They brought in a team of experts to work on that and get it ready to go, um, and it looks absolutely stunning. It, it, looks, it looks terrific, yeah. and our group did a really terrific job of getting the paint right and making sure that everything is perfect. Yes. Another <laughs> and, it, it's, uh, and it's a lot bigger it, than yes. you think it is. Yes, it's a lot bigger than, <laughs> than you would think it is, but it, it's really cool in there. Uh, one of the other things that I really like is they've got a, a display case filled with Sally Ride artifacts. So her T-38 helmet, they have the Olympic torch that she carried, and coolest of all, I think, is the telescope that she used as a kid to stargaze. And it's, it, I think that's really neat to see that. Well, the other thing that's nice is that they actually put her tennis racket in there. And I don't think people really know that, you know, science, you know, was something she was really into, but she also thought about you know, being a professional she tennis She was a world-class tennis she player. She was a really good tennis player. I know she, she was friends with Billie Jean King and, mm -hmm. and just an incredible tennis player. And, and to see kind of that her life in perspective there is, is really, really neat. And it was neat also to be able to interview um, Christine uh, Cook. Cook, Cook. Yes. And who is an astronaut. New class of astronaut. She was very inspired by Sally Ride. Yes. So the new milestones of Flight yeah. Hall is just very inspiring. A, an, it's a great. <laughs> another one that I really like, I got to tell about this one, is um, the Viking Lander. And what's really cool about that is that's an engineering model that we have inside, but the Smithsonian owns the real one. On Mars. On Mars. It's on <laughs> Mars. But we actually have the deed to it. And so if we can ever go fetch it, you know, we could potentially put it on display. Or we could just open a museum on Mars. I, I like that idea too. I could I could go work on Mars. You, you <laughs> certainly could, Marty. Do you want to talk a little bit about the app? We've yes. got a brand new app out. So uh, we have, when you go into the new re revitalized uh, Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall, one of the first things that you're going to see is this interactive media wall, which is incredibly cool. We got a chance to preview it the other day, and there are these bubbles that float around, and you, you touch a bubble, and it brings up an artifact that's on display either here at the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center in Chantilly, Virginia, and it tells you where in the museum it is and more information, but beyond that, it links you to other things. And then, as it's linking to different things, um, you can favorite different items, and then the coolest part is if you've got the app, Go Flight, you can download that tour to your phone and then walk around with that tour. Um, so here's a little bit more information about Go Flight. I have no idea how long it's going to be. Jeff?
Well, now that you've seen how to use the app, you might want to tell them that they could come here tonight and actually make their own tour. Yeah, today is the 40th birthday of the National Air and Space Museum. It opened July 1st, 1976. It actually opened with a signal from a spacecraft on its way to Mars that cut a ribbon. And so we are having an all night long party to celebrate the museum's 40th birthday. And when you're in the museum, uh, there are gonna be a lot of activities. Uh, there'll be scavenger hunts. We'll do DC Feud, Yep. which is very it's similar to a game, game show, show you might watch on TV, but it's it's a lot of fun DC type type trivia and museum trivia tonight. Yes, so there's a lot of things going on down here, so you should probably come down. We're waiting for the opening ceremony to start, which is we've got a lot of great guests here tonight it, too. It, we do, and right now the museum is closed. Um, we shut down at 5:30. We're going to reopen as soon as the ceremony is over at nine o'clock, and everybody's going to get a chance to go in. They're bringing food trucks down here tonight. Um, we've got all of these really great activities, including um, this webcast that you're watching. We're going to be on NASA TV until midnight, and then after midnight, you can switch over to the uh, Air and Space uh, newly launched website and finish up watching because we're going all the way until 8 o'clock in the morning, 12 hours of interesting guests and people coming on, and you never can tell who we're going to be talking to tonight. Well, we have, we do know a couple of the guests. Uh, tonight, we have actually uh, relatives of the Wright brothers and we'll be talking to them. We've got a couple of astronauts. We do, the Wright, the Wright Brothers relatives, they came in yesterday and talked with us. They are so nice. And one of them is just graduated with his degree in astronomical engineering. And he was absolutely inspired by the Wright Brothers. So I can't wait to hear his story. Um, and like Beth said, we've got astronaut Tom Jones, veteran of four space shuttle flights coming on with us tonight. As a matter of fact, something interesting about him, not only did he fly four times, he flew twice in a row which is fairly rare. Right now, you're, you go up, um, you've got uh, you know, a two year wait before your next flight, and then, uh, but he, he flew up twice in a row. And we also have movies going on yes. as well. Yes, uh, for example, at five o'clock in the morning, Dave Bio Baranek is gonna be introducing Top Gun and he's gonna be talking with us a little bit before that. He was actually a Top Gun pilot when they filmed the movie, so I'm pretty excited about that one. We also have uh, Destination Moon that we have um, both Kevin Murphy from Mystery Science Theater and Phil Plate, who is the bad astronomer. And a couple of our curators. That's gonna be so much fun. So they're gonna go in, they're gonna watch Destination Moon, which is a, a science fiction movie created in 1950. 1950. So about 20 years before the moon landing. So they went in and, and they're gonna do this just like Mystery Science Theater. And uh, a couple of our curators, I heard that one of our curators sent Kevin Murphy 30 pages of notes this week on that. And I have no doubt that he actually sent 30 pages of notes. Um, that's going to be a lot of fun to, to see how they do that movie. Um, and then the first movie tonight is actually only 15 minutes long. Right, right, right. It is, um, a, it's Destination, or Trip, to, Trip the to the Moon. And you you have seen this movie, or seen clips of it. It's it's this big moon face and dancing girls. and They launch a, a, a canister to the moon out of a cannon, and it hits the moon right in the eye, and it and I know you've seen it before, and so they're gonna watch that tonight in our IMAX theater. It should be really cool. And then do you wanna tell them what's going on at midnight? Because I know you've been dying to talk about this. I'm so excited about this. Um, at midnight, we're gonna be showing Galaxy Quest, one of my all-time favorite movies. By Grabthar's Hammer, by the Sons of Warvan, you will be avenged. I'm so excited, but you at home can participate in this. This is what's really cool. Okay. Um, the Okudas who worked on the original Star Trek, or who worked on Star Trek movies, are gonna introduce the movie and they're gonna be tweeting during the movie. And so we encourage you guys to watch the movie at home if you've got it on DVD or some other way that you might be able to watch that movie at home. Watch it, start it at midnight and tweet along with everybody here in the museum and it should be a whole lot of fun. And then my favorite movie is after that, the movie you don't like. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, 2001, so prepare for 15 minutes of nothing but monkeys at the beginning of it. And I, I don't know, I, you're just not, you, you're not in the right mindset, I, I don't think. So 2001 is, is a fantastic movie, uh, and what's great about it is it, it's science fiction, but, but the science is so good in it. 
Uh, the um, you don't hear people screaming in space or rockets because you wouldn't hear that. The special effects are amazing, and and when I watched it, I was amazed at the use of silence, which I hadn't seen in a movie like that before. Right, right. Um, but I thought that was really cool. Now, a, a funny story. This week we had a couple of issues in our. Uh, broadcast studio where we edit videos and so we had a big tall black cabinet that we had to actually move into the center of the room and I walked into the room having just watched 2001 about a week ago and I walk in and here is this big black obelisk in the middle of the room and it kind of freaked me out a little bit. It was a little <laughs> Little weird. You are very easily freaked out, I think. <laughs> so should we tell people who we are and why why we're That's talking? Probably not <laughs> a bad idea. We host a TV show for middle school science students from here at the Air and Space Museum called STEM in 30. It's a fast-paced show for teachers to use in their classrooms. We typically don't have a segment on the show longer than about three, three minutes, minutes, so it's very usable for teachers. Um, should we show them what it's all about? Yeah, let's show them what it's about. Check this out. Actually, that's what's coming up next year. Do you want to start uh, with what we're kicking off in September? I'm so excited about this. Um, we're actually starting with Star Trek as our first show, and how science fiction has become science reality. And we've got a whole lot of things planned for that show. As a matter of fact, just a few minutes ago, I got a chance to talk to Leonard Nimoy's son. Um, so we'll be seeing him later in the, in the broadcast later. as well. And so we're, we're talking all about science fiction and science fantasy and how a lot of the things that Star Trek, you know, invented basically, have now become reality. And then the other big piece of that show is how Star Trek, this science fiction show, has really inspired a whole many generations of astronauts and scientists and engineers. And we've talked to a lot of them. We so have. we'll hear from them them firsthand. Uh, so other things that are going on tonight, we are, if you're here, we have docent tours. Uh, of all the, the new uh, gallery, and we'll go around the museum some. Uh, we are also having pocket science. Do you want to talk a little bit about the explainers and pocket science? Yeah, so we have a program here called the explainers, and these are um, high school and college age students that wear these red shirts, and when you come into the museum, they're going to engage you in science activities. They have a space toilet, which you'll actually, actually see later in the night. Um, they have a, a space suit that they work on. Uh, they have a black hole activity. They have all of these really great things. My kids love coming in and, and doing these activities with the explainers. Um, and my favorite explainer story, I think you were there that day. Oh, right. Um, the explainers had the space toilet sitting outside the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery. And the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery is all about um, the space shuttle and, and since then and, and current space flight projects. And they're engaging people that come by. And this, this gentleman walks by and they're like, sir, would you like to make a guess about what this is? And it's a funny looking contraption with a really small toilet seat on it. And he goes, well, I think I know what that is. And they're like, well, what do you think it is? He goes, I'm pretty sure that's a space toilet. And they're like, oh, well, how do you know? And he goes, well, do you see that picture hanging up in front of the gallery? That's me. It was an astronaut that just happened to be in the building that day for a conference and walked by as they had the space toilet out and their jaws just dropped. And then we spent about an hour looking at the, the spacesuit that we use mm -hmm. on display. And he really pointed out 
how accurate that suit is. Right. I think there was one little piece of it that wasn't accurate, but everything else, I mean, it's dead on to what they're actually wearing in space. Now, do you want to talk a little bit about the astronaut that we had the privilege of meeting this past week? We actually got a chance to interview astronaut um, Michael Collins. He was the Apollo 11 command module pilot, so he he, he flew around the backside of, of the moon. And I had met Collins a couple of times and just really, I, the more I met him, he's just a really nice, really friendly guy, was the first director of the museum. Uh, and so now I had a sit down interview with him and, and I wanted to ask him this question for so long. And I said, did you feel a sense of isolation when you were on the far side, because there's no communication back there. You you can't hear Earth. You're uh, back then. It was all line of sight, so they didn't have any satellites orbiting. So they, if they weren't in line of sight with the Earth, they were out of contact. Yeah, so they were completely out of contact. So I, I really wondered about, you know, that sort of sense of isolation. You're so far away from home. It's quiet. And I, so I said, did you feel this sense of isolation? And he said, No, actually, I rather enjoyed the quiet. He was took so, all the wind out of my sails. <laughs> he was so awesome, and, he, and he's he's very laid back. And we 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 did some segments for Stim and Thirty. We did some we we did some filming with him that you'll actually see during the ceremony tonight. Um, but as I was talking with him, um, I asked him about Stim because our show is all about Stim. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he stopped me and he goes, "You need to add another e." He said, "You need to add another another e for English." because you have to be able to write and to communicate. And then he went from being this, this quiet gentleman sitting in this chair to this booming voice that was echoing off the walls in the gallery. And, and of course, we're sitting in front of the Columbia, uh, the Lunar Command module that he flew. And, it, and he's just got this booming voice as he recites a poem. And it was one of the coolest things I've, I've ever been a part of. I've only been at the museum about a year and a half. I taught for 16 years before that. And to, to be able to sit next to the Columbia, next to Michael Collins, and have him reciting this poem in this booming voice, something I, I will never forget. Well, I think the other thing that we ought to mention uh, about the museum is that there, there are very few reproductions. And, and they're only there because the original artifacts were destroyed or they're gone. Or they're on the moon. Or they're or on the moon. Um, and so we have the real stuff. And I don't think that people fully appreciate when you come here and you go to see the Wright Flyer, you didn't see the real Wright Flyer in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. It's actually here. Yeah, yeah the real Wright Flyer's here. The only thing that's, I mean, there are a couple pieces of it that aren't original, like the, the fabric covering. We have that in a case because it was, it was falling apart. Mm -hmm. But as far as the structure of it goes, incredible. And one of the really neat things about when looking at the Wright Flyer the Wright brothers were bike mechanics. Exactly. And when you look at that, we actually have on display, you should really come here and see it because it's really cool to see these two in line with each other. The bike that they built and the plane, and you see the same parts. And one of the things that uh, the Wright brothers' relatives were talking to us about last night that they're really passionate about is that the major parts of an airplane that you see on the Wright Flyer are still on airplanes today. So mm -hmm. I leave here tomorrow morning at eight o'clock and the airplane that I'm gonna be flying on has got the same basic parts as the Wright Flyer it works, works from the same way. over a hundred years ago. Yeah, so you think about it, you've got the Wright Flyer and then the Columbia uh, command module all in the same museum. And there's just so much to see here. And I, people come in and they're like, oh, it'll take an hour. It, it could take days. <laughs> I, like I said, I've been here a year and a half, and I've been here twice as a tourist before that. And just last week, I went through um, the interactive wall, and I was, I was working around on it. And when you click on a button, it's got a picture. So you click on this bubble, it pops up. There were a lot of things that I didn't know were on display in the museum. And one of the coolest is a piece of the original Wright Flyer, a little bitty piece, flew on the Columbia and went to the moon and now it's on display along with a letter from Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins and Buzz Aldrin. Well, I, we have the opening ceremonies. Oh, I'm getting ready to start. About 10 minutes away from the opening ceremony. Um, we want to kind of preview a few of the people that you're going to um, be meeting at the ceremony tonight. And the first is, our, is the director of our museum, uh, the John and Adrian Mars director of the National Air and Space Museum, General Jack Daly. 
four-star Marine general, fighter pilot. He's flown just about everything that you can imagine. Um, a helicopter pilot. Uh, he was on the Joint Chiefs of Staff and mm -hmm. number two at NASA for a long time. And he's been here for uh, a, quite a while and does a, an amazing job of leading this museum. And we will also have one of the explainers. Yes. She will also be out here uh, to she, kick us. Ray will sort of kick us off yes, and uh, to get us rolling. She is a, a uh, an upcoming junior at American University, and she is a physics major. Um, so you'll see her during the ceremony as well. Um, Robert Curran, a uh, cultural anthropologist who is now the uh, acting provost of the Smithsonian. Um, he'll be speaking as well. Um, and so who else do we have? We have um, uh, Nicole Malkowski, who's the first female Thunderbird pilot, correct? Yes, yes. So she will be here talking about uh, a little a little bit about herself. And so she'll be here. And then we have people that have been on staff for 40 years since the museum opened. So so yes. they will be, yes. they, and, be out and, here as well. Uh, some docents, some uh, curators, just some, some different people that were here when the museum opened and, and uh, they've seen a lot in the last 40 years. And one of the things I'm looking forward to uh, as we interview, we'll be having a lot of curators on mm -hmm. after the opening ceremony and they all have these great stories. In fact, yes. one of our conservators who will be on here as well, uh, will be telling us ghost stories at about four o'clock in the morning. Ghost <laughs> stories, not I'm just random if, ghost if stories. I'm still awake. <laughs> but ghost stories that, that he's experienced either here or at one of our other facilities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and w you can see probably behind us, there is a, um, an Air Force brass ceremonial, the Air Force brass ceremonial quintet. They're gonna be playing a little fanfare to open the ceremony tonight. And then they're gonna be playing as visitors come in. And there are a lot of people here. We've got a little section roped off for some VIPs uh, sitting up front. And then a few uh, actually right behind us, the people that have been here 40 years are taking their places. So we really are getting ready to start. Um, but I'd say there's, there are several hundred people here waiting to go into the museum and see the new Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. It's going to be really, uh, really exciting. Um, we also have uh, Greta Lundberg, a uh, Boeing representative, will be speaking tonight, and she used to work for the White House. She did. And now she works she for worked, Boeing. And she worked for John, with John Kerry's. John Kerry's campaign. And so we really do have some, some incredibly interesting people that are going to be uh, speaking tonight. And... I, I just can't wait for people to see the new the new hall. You got the Spirit of St. Louis hanging up above, the Bell X-1, Spaceship 1, and Spaceship Spaceship 1 is actually in the landing configuration. Right, so right. So the tail's up, and, it, and it's just a kind of a different way to see that. Um, one of the neat things being here, I've been here, oh, I don't know, a month or two, and I came in one day, and the Spirit of St. Louis is sitting on the floor. They had brought it down for conservation, and mm -hmm. then... One of the neat things that we got we got to do a while back is we got to talk to Reeve Lindbergh, Charles and Ann Morrow Lindbergh's daughter, standing in front of the Spirit of St. Louis. And something our viewers may not know, when you see that Spirit of St. Louis on display, it looks like it's metal and it's, you know, everything. Right. The engine cowling and the engine's all metal, but as far as the actual covering, it's fabric. <laughs> it's, it's had a and process called doping done to it. But it's mm -hmm. fabric. And some of it was actually removed. In France, they, they wanted to take a, take a souvenir. And uh, they, they actually cut some of the fabric off. And our conservators, when it was down, uh, found where they, they stitched the, the fabric back together. Yep. Uh, and then he, and he'll be talking yes. about it later. But he found some other really neat, neat things that uh, is that... really incredible so that is one of the things that by working here we get to hear some of those inside stories and that's what we want to share with you guys tonight our viewers is is those inside stories that you don't always get to hear one of my favorites and and tom crouch unfortunately can't be here tonight right. tom we're thinking about you and your family right now um but one of the stories that he shared with us is that he was doing some research at um, i think the national archives yes and he had orville wright's pocket notebook now tom crouch knew some of the people that had known the Wright brothers. So he's, he's really close with the family and he was looking through and he found this little girl's signature on the inside back cover. And he knew the girl. Now she was a 90 year old lady at that right. point. Yes. And he went up and he goes, 
do you remember this or do you know what that's about? And he look, and she looks at Tom and goes, oh my goodness, I remember that. Uncle Orv came over to the house, Uncle Orv, came over to the house and I had learned to write my name and I was so excited about it that he goes, well, here, write it for me. And he pulls out his pocket notebook and hands it to her and she signs her name and now that's in the National Archive. And I think the other thing that we should mention is that the museum has archives. Yes. So when you're, I've been doing research in, in, in our archives and you run across these letters that, you know, very sincerely Orville Wright. And, and the, the archives, you can actually use them. Yep. Uh, you need to make an appointment. The, most of them are out at the Varhazi mm -hmm. Center, uh, which is in Chantilly, yep. Virginia, where the, um, Space Shuttle Discovery yep. is now on, on display. And so, we actually got a chance to go into the rare book room here at the museum mm -hmm. and hold a book that was, it was an old aviation book signed by all of these aviation pioneers, including Orville Wright, Charles Lindbergh, I think Chuck Yeager was in, I mean, uh -huh. it's, in, it's a who's who of aviation and taped inside it was a piece of the original Wright Flyer. Right, and there's just so much here and there's so many stories to tell. And fortunately, Marty, we have about 12 hours. I know. So I know. we'll now, be taking a look at some of these stories. As now, we as we get worse and worse all night long <laughs> as we go, I want everybody to keep in mind that Charles Lindbergh was awake for 36 hours to make the flight across the Atlantic, and he was awake for 24 hours before that. So getting through till 8 o'clock in the morning should be no problem. For Charles Lindbergh. For Charles Lindbergh. <laughs> but not so much for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think caffeine's going to be our friend. Um, I see that we're, we've got our, our quintet up here. We've got our people that were here from, from 40 years ago ready to go. Um, we also have a projection that's going to be up on the side of the building, which is going to be stunning and amazingly. I couldn't believe this. Our boss told us there's a window from 745 to 9 o'clock tonight where it's Shh, not going to rain. Shh, don't say that out loud. And so far, it rained about a half hour before we started the, the, the broadcast. It looks pretty good right now. I'm going to knock on some metal or something. Knock but, on some wood. Yeah, some wood. But um, right now, it's looking really promising that we're going to get this actually in, and it's going to be really exciting. And, man, when they, when they light this thing up and we get to go inside, you've got to come here to see this. So if you're in the D.C. area, come on down. We are open all night long. Food trucks, games, explainers, docents, all of this stuff. And um, and if you're not here right now, please come. We're only closed one day a year, and that's yes. Christmas Day. Yep. Otherwise, come on in, and it is just, uh, it, it's a mecca. It, it truly is. Um, it is, I'm a little biased, but even before <laughs> I started working here, it, it was always my, my absolute favorite museum. And I just, I, I think there's, a, you know, when you visit here, you can't, again, I want to reiterate, you can't spend an hour. I mean, there, there's just too much to do and yeah. to see. And now uh, we are going to be going under uh, some renovation uh, in the next couple of years. So we'll, the, the Boeing uh, Milestones of Flight Hall is only the beginning. Yep. So we'll be starting on the West End um, and we're going to give whole new treatment uh, and it's it's just it's it's going to be spectacular. So it'll be it'll be an interesting time. I've just started to hear some of the some of the ideas that they have on some of the galleries and some of the designs, and it's going to be incredibly cool when when it all gets reopened, which is a long way off. But we are <laughs> staying open the whole time. Um, right. You know, we, we could have close. closed the museum to to remodel and everything, but we're going to stay open. Um, you're still going to be able to come in and see things, and we're going to give updates. And you can always watch STEM in 30 to uh, to learn about some of the artifacts. One of the things that we're hoping to be able to do is once galleries start to close, we're going to do shows about those galleries and about um, the artifacts that you may not be able to see that are currently on display. Um, so and one of the other neat things that we have is that we, um, oh, I think we're getting ready to start. All right. Okay. Let's Ceremony's getting ready to start. start so Enjoy the show. The show. Aviation is America's story. We went from the first powered controlled manned flight to walking on the moon 66 years. The Air and Space Museum shows you exactly 
that history, everything that we have has a special significance to the development of aviation and space in this country. I came and saw this aircraft. I remember it so well as a small boy. My father explaining to me what it was. It was the first airplane I've ever flown. Here they are in the same room uh, with the airplane that the Wright brothers flew. One of the main purposes of this museum is to preserve these artifacts forever. Sure, you can have reproductions or mock-ups, but here you have the real thing. Everything that's in here has a story of great significance. It did it first or better than anything else. And you have to stop a little bit and think about the story as you view the object. I always find something marvelous, something that completely surprises me. The Discovery Space Shuttle is so significant and it is so quintessentially Smithsonian. This is the shuttle that has inspired a generation to realize the importance of space flight. Our mission is to commemorate, educate, and inspire. But it's wonderful to see the, the young people come in here and be inspired by things that have happened before and uh, maybe be inspired to do a little better in math and science and technology in their schoolwork. It's so important for young people to really get a good education in STEM. They see what has been accomplished in the past, and then they think about, well, what can I do? It really changed my life. It changed my direction. It helped orient me along the path of becoming a scientist. Who knows what you will be inspired to be the next person on Mars. Space exploration should continue. The Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum is more than just a collection here on the mall. It's inspiration. If we can inspire, then we've done everything else right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jack Daly, the John and Adrian Mars Director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. And it's my honor to welcome you here tonight as we commemorate 40 years of inspiring the world and celebrate a new chapter for the world's most popular museum. For kicking us off with a high style tonight, I'd like to thank the United States Air Force Band Ceremonial Brass Quintet. Please give them a round of applause. The Air Force Band serenades here frequently during the summer, so if you watch the schedule, you can hear the, the entire program uh, uh, among your friends here at the museum. When the museum first opened in July 1st, 1976, President Ford called it a perfect birthday present from the American people to themselves. And we often say that aviation is America's story. 
but the revolution in the sky sparked by the Wright brothers more than a century ago belongs to the world. The astronauts who saw the Earth from the moon only 66 years after the first flight at Kitty Hawk had a special perspective on the global impact of that first small step. The director who oversaw this museum's construction and stood on these very steps to open the doors 40 years ago was none other than Major General Michael Collins, United States Air Force retired. Command module pilot for Apollo 11. Here to tell us more about our early days, I'd like to introduce a short video featuring General Collins. I came to Washington sneaking up on 1976, and I used to run around town saying, Museum on the Mall by the Bicentennial. My name is uh, Mike Collins. Uh, at one time, was in the space program on Project Gemini and Apollo, which you know is the first flight to the moon. Then after that, I uh, was lucky enough to be director of, of this museum, the National Air and Space Museum. So many of the things that are in it, the artifacts in it, are old friends of mine, and, uh, and, and some of them uh, way before my time. We were supposed to open uh, July 4th, 1976, and we actually beat it by three days, July 1st, 1976. Uh, we were uh, supposed to cut the ribbon out here, the ribbon on the mall side of the building, declaring it open. The signal came from a spacecraft between here and Mars in outer space, and uh, I was holding my breath you know, I was thinking all those electrons gone lost up there in space and all these VIPs standing around looking at this ribbon and this mechanical shearing device and nothing would happen. But believe it or not, all the electrons did their cute little things and the ribbon got snipped and the building got opened. It was, it was good. At the peak of the Apollo program, when Neil Armstrong stepped out onto the surface of the moon, that, I think, was kind of the peak of the interest that the American public had. Buildings like this do a lot to sustain that level of interest, and, and, and that's one of the things that I think is very important about this beautiful surrounding, the National Air and Space Museum, which is a vital part of the Smithsonian Institution. The museum General Collins built, like the ship he flew to the moon, is a priceless treasure to the people of the world, and I'm honored to follow in his footsteps as director. As he mentioned, there was tension about whether the signal from Mars would come in time to cut the ribbon. Just in case, the President of the United States was on hand with a pair of scissors as a backup. But the Viking performed flawlessly. Just days later, the Viking 1 lander became the first American spacecraft to land on Mars. In 1984, after its mission was complete, NASA formally transferred the ownership of Viking 1 lander to the museum. Of course, we haven't been able to collect it yet, so NASA, working with a jet propulsion lab and the University of Arizona, was kind enough to check in on it for us, and this picture was taken by the high-rise camera aboard the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to celebrate the museum's 40th birthday. It demonstrates the challenge ahead and we have unfinished business on Mars, and it's up to the men and women of this museum to inspire the next generation to take up the task. It would be impossible to recognize all the staff and volunteers who have performed the museum's mission over the decades, but we are honored to have 10 of them with us here tonight who have been here as part of the team since the very beginning, 40 years ago. As I call your name, please stand. Phil Edwards. Karen Manis. I'm glad I didn't ask you to hold your applause. This is much better than waiting till the end. Okay, Ted Maxwell. Barbara O'Malley. <laughs> Bill Rowe. Chris Strain, Mark
Mark Taylor. Bob Vanderlinden. Estelle Washington. And Ken Young. Together, they have dedicated more than 400 years to this museum and its hundreds of millions of visitors and are the perfect representatives of our committed staff, present, past, and future. Please give them now, please give them a round of applause for their extraordinary service. The National Air and Space Museum is just one part of the Smithsonian Institution. It is the centerpiece, but it's just one part of the Smithsonian Institution, which includes 19 and soon to be 20 museums, nine research centers, and extensive global outreach activities. We wouldn't be able to fulfill our mission at the Smith Museum without James Smithson's mandate for the increase and diffusion of knowledge, which has guided the Smithsonian for almost 170 years. Our next speaker arrived at the Smithsonian in 1976 for the nation's bicentennial celebration. For many years, he directed the Center for Folk, Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. So if you enjoyed the Smithsonian's Folk Life Festival out on the mall today, you have him to thank. Now he oversees all of the institutions, museums, and research centers, and a list of other centers and programs and activities too numerous to list. To list. It's my great pleasure to introduce the Acting Provost and Undersecretary for Museums and Research, Dr. Richard Curran. Richard? Thank you, Jack. As, as General Daly said, uh, I, was, uh, I first worked for the Smithsonian. I was young then. I was 25 years old and first worked for the Smithsonian when this museum opened. This, during that time, we were celebrating the bicentennial of the United States, 200 years of our country. And just remember what it was like then. Now, younger people will not, but those, those of, a, a, of a certain age will. We were in a space race with the Russians, with the Soviets. There was a Cold War going on. And the whole challenge to go to space, and when President Kennedy, just over here in front of the Capitol at his inauguration, challenged the country to send a man to the moon and back before the end of the decade, that was fresh in our minds. And so when we went to space, and when this museum was built, it was really a monument to our country in terms of our science, technology, and engineering, the, the kind of innovation that made us great and historically has made us great as a country. But it was even more than that. And if you were here 40 years ago when this museum opened, you recognized at that time, just as those who were old enough to remember when Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon, that this was a victory not only of science and engineering technology, but national unity, national imagination. We were all very much together as Americans at that time and very proud of our national accomplishment. Now this museum has continued to inspire, and as Jack said, millions and millions, over 350 million people have walked through this museum. They've worn out the carpet many times. But generation after generation has been inspired what, what, they, what they've seen and looked up, and many a child walked through this museum and said, I want to be an astronaut, or an astrophysicist, or I want to be a pilot, or I want to be the person that makes these things happen and designs these airplanes and spaceships. And so this has really been an inspirational place for our country, for our citizens, and people around the world who've been here. Now, Jack is Michael Collins' successor, right, down a few steps, who built this museum. And uh, that's something Jack and I shared, because after Mike Collins was the director of this museum, he became the undersecretary of the Smithsonian. And I'm very proud to occupy that office today. And as I often say, well, Mike Collins had to go to the moon and back to do all this, 
All I have to do is walk up a flight of stairs. But it makes me ever so proud to be part of this effort, part of the museum, part of the Smithsonian, that really serves all of you, all of us, and people beyond. We take very seriously the idea of our mission of increasing and diffusing knowledge of inspiring the next generation. It's a great responsibility we share, and tonight we are so, so happy to celebrate this birthday, and you have not only the people here, but we're joined by others who have special birthday greetings. Happy birthday. 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 Happy 40th birthday. Happy 40th birthday. Happy 40th birthday. Thank you for inspiring me and my fellow astronauts. Congratulations. Congratulations. Congratulations on 40 years of excellence. Keep inspiring those generations of future space explorers to aim high and reach for the stars. Congratulations to the National Air and Space Museum on 40 fabulous years. Happy birthday to the National Air and Space Museum. NASA wishes you many more decades of inspiring the next generation to reach higher and explore. Keep empowering those kids to live their dreams. Happy birthday, National Air and Space Museum. Over the last 40 years, we've opened many new galleries and exhibitions, including the state-of-the-art Stephen F. Udbrahazi Center in Chantilly, Virginia. But the heart of the museum has always been our central exhibit space, now called the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. More than 327 million people have passed through the doors behind me into one of the world's great public spaces, dedicated to discovery and exploration. As we transform the gallery for the, for the next 300 million visitors, we work to interpret the priceless treasures of human achievement, not merely display them. The new exhibits capture the spark behind the milestone stories and fire the imagination like never before. According to a recent study, the world needs more than a million pilots and aviation technicians to meet the global demand over the next 20 years. That kind of growth requires investment on a global scale, and there's no better place to engage the young people of the world than the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. I'd like to thank Boeing for supporting our mission and to inspire the millions who will pass through these doors in the years ahead. It's now my great pleasure to welcome Greta Lundberg, the Vice President for Strategy and Advocacy at Boeing. Greta? Thank you so much. Thank you, General Daly, for your service to our country and for your leadership of this great American institution. I'm Greta Lundberg, Vice President for Strategy and Advocacy at the Boeing Company, and it's honored to be here with you tonight to celebrate the Boeing milestone of Flight Hall during our centennial year, as well as this museum's 40th anniversary, and also my birthday, so it's a special night for me as well. Thanks. <laughs> As a mother of a four-year-old, my daughter talks a lot about what she wants to be when she grows up. Some weeks it's a firefighter, other weeks it's Batman or Wonder Woman. But after countless visits to the Air and Space Museum, all she talks about now is wanting to be an astronaut. While her career options may evolve, I know she'll never lose that fascination with space and science and innovation. And that's a testament to the stories and experiences this place unlocks for its millions of visitors each year. That's the reason that Boeing has supported the National Air and Space Museum for more than two decades. We, we agree with the museum that our goal should be inspiring the next generation of innovators and building on the progress of the last century. Now this July 15th, 100 years ago, our founder, Bill Boeing, got his start in a little red barn in Seattle, building planes made almost entirely of timber and canvas. Over the past century, the men and women of Boeing have helped build the world's largest aerospace company and shape the course of human history along the way. 
Just think about the progress that we've made together. Humans went from walking on Earth to walking on the moon, from riding horses to flying jet planes and spacecraft. And while we celebrate the pioneers that built this incredible legacy of American innovation, it's more important than ever for our country to inspire a new generation of leaders to dream, to innovate, to explore, and to inspire. As you make your way through the galleries tonight, I'd ask that you just imagine the artifacts and stories that will narrate our next 100 years, and we look forward to being part of that at Boeing. Thank you all for coming out tonight, and enjoy the museum. Our next speaker knows how important that first spark can be to set you on a path to great achievement. After her first air show when she was five and a notable visit to this museum when she was 12, her path led to the Civil Air Patrol and onto the United States Air Force Academy. From there, she became a respected Air Force officer and decorated combat pilot. By the way, she flew her combat in the F-15E Strike Eagle. I should mention that she also had her husband as a crew member on that. So it, uh, it was a real family affair on that one. As the first female member of the elite Thunderbird demonstration team, and later as the White House Fellow and Executive Director of Joining Forces, she embodies one of aviation's core lessons. From milestones to moonshots, it takes courage to attempt the things that no one has done before, and unshakable confidence to achieve your goals. She's an outstanding role model for any young person who aims high in life, and she's not done yet. It's my great pleasure to introduce Colonel Nicole Malakowski. Oh, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you, General Daly, for those gracious, uh, gracious words. It's uh, always a joy to be here, sir. Um, and it is an honor, like all of you, to be standing here at this iconic American museum. I think it's a museum that in so many ways embodies everything that is great about our country. Freedom, innovation, technology, creativity, and big dreams. And today we're here to trumpet the significance of milestones. The 40th anniversary of this museum is a milestone. All of the milestones over time and aviation and spaceflight. So it got me thinking about milestones, like why do we celebrate them and, and why do we mark them as important? And milestones are those events along the arc of history, big ones and small ones, that in this case have transformed aviation and spaceflight in so many ways. And, and oftentimes it's ways that folks often remark that mankind could never have even imagined. You've heard that statement, that mankind could never even have imagined. But is that really true? Isn't it in fact our imaginations that these milestones, and in our imaginations, these milestones are conceived and ultimately achieved. And over the past 40 years, as the other speakers have noted, this museum has sparked the imagination of countless visitors, young and old alike. And it was this place that sparked my own imagination back in 1986. As a young 12-year-old girl, I walked these halls, spending an entire day, notebook in hand, reading every placard, inspecting every single artifact, and discovering every nook and cranny that is in this building behind me. And I was doing this and I was imagining, imagining my place in this world of aviation. And that visit 30 years ago served as a launching point for my own experiences over the past 20 years wearing our nation's uniform. You see, back in 1986, there weren't a lot of women pilots in the military. And the law prohibited women from flying fighter aircraft. And in fact, in elementary school, I came to my class I'm going to be a fighter pilot someday. And as you can imagine, the response at the time was maybe less than enthusiastic. And in fact, a teacher even needled me a little bit and said, quote, maybe you should come back to class when you have something different in mind. So demoralized, I returned home, shed a little tear in front of my parents, wondering aloud in the dramatic way that a young 12-year-old girl would, why couldn't I become a fighter pilot? But that summer, my parents brought me here to this museum, a place where my imagination could finally run free, unconstrained by people's expectations of me or the status quo. And this place showed me that imagination is all about embracing the art of the possible. 
my life was transformed here forever. I stood in awe of the Wright Flyer and the Wright Brothers' legacy, Charles Lindbergh and the spirit of St. Louis. And for the very first time in my life, in a substantive way, I learned about the contributions women had made to aviation and spaceflight. Amelia Earhart, Bessie Coleman, Geraldine Mock, Jackie Cochran, the list goes on. Their stories flooded my imagination with the art of the possible. And then, in the smallest little corner of the museum, I saw them, my heroes to this very day, the women Air Force service pilots of World War II, America's first women military aviators. So the light bulb went off in my 12-year-old head over 40 years ago, prior to my visit in 1986. Those women flew. They flew in service to their country. And at that moment, I realized I could too. The 12-year-old in me was catalyzed to action. My imagination was unleashed, and it led to 20 years of flying the F-15E and the F-16. And I'm watching this wonderful group of young folks down here in the front, and I think, how many astronauts and how many scientists and engineers, how many pilots are we going to have inspired here today, tonight, in this museum? And so it goes, that arc of history moves on, milestones conceived and achieved by our imagination. This museum reminds us that the world of aviation and spaceflight is open to all of us. Milestones are not an end to themselves. They simply set the bar higher. They show us what the art of the possible looks like, and they serve as a call to action to all of us to achieve those things that we can and we do conceive in our wildest dreams. And that's a wonderful lesson to humanity. And so with that, to the Smithsonian team and General Daly, sir, sir, thank you very much. My heartfelt thanks for letting me be here tonight, um, for bringing imaginations to life, including my own. And God bless the wonderful men and women and their flying machines. Can you figure why we had her speak here tonight? <laughs> Nicole, she's exactly what we're, she was hooked here, and that's exactly what we hope happens to many of these young folks that come through the museum. But thank you all for joining us tonight to celebrate the National Air and Space Museum. Of course, tonight is not about the past, it's about the future. The future is in uh, this museum and the future of exploration and discovery on Earth and off of it. For 40 years, we've commemorated the greatest achievements of the 20th century, but now we turn our sights to shaping the 21st century and to passing the torch to the future generations. To that end, I'd like to turn the helm of tonight's program over to one of the museum's youngest team members. The Explainers Program, which is sponsored by General Electric Aviation, employs high school and college students to engage visitors of all ages on the scientific principles of aviation and space exploration. They open the doors to discovery for visitors from all over the world, and they're going to do that for us here tonight. Here to launch the new Boeing of Milestones Flight Hall and to introduce the next chapter of the National Air and Space Museum is a junior at American University majoring in physics, and her name is Ray Stewart. Ray, come on up. Thank you, General Daly. We are moments away from opening the doors and kicking off our All Night at the Museum celebration. We have lots of programs and events all throughout the night and into tomorrow morning, and we hope you can join us for them. Tonight we gather to honor both the legacy and future of this great museum. Places like the National Air and Space Museum have the profound ability to draw out awe and wonder and plant seeds of curiosity. In my own life, it was museums like this one that ignited my love for science. I'm here in Washington, D.C. to study physics and thankfully have the incredible opportunity to be an explainer here at the museum. Explainers get to best see the true value of these artifacts. As we tell the stories behind the inventions, innovations, and scientific discoveries within these walls, we witness the past collide with the future with every smile, every wide-eyed look, and every moment of true understanding. So many people who have come through these doors leave touched and inspired by what they have seen, and these experiences act as seeds for further innovation and discovery. 
I am so proud of this museum, and I'm so blessed by the way it has touched not only my own life, but also the lives of millions of other people. So happy birthday, National Air and Space Museum. We are T minus 47 seconds from opening the doors and launching our new, brand new Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. And the explainers here are going to open the doors and begin the all night at the museum. But before we do that, we have one last birthday message. So go ahead and take a look. Hello, I'm Expedition 48 Commander Jeff Williams of NASA, flying 250 miles above the Earth aboard the International Space Station. My crewmates and I wanted to take a moment to wish the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum a happy 40th birthday. Your magnificent museum has inspired millions over the past four decades in commemorating the spirit of exploration and the achievements of human flight. With that, and to start a new era for the museum, please begin your countdown for the reopening of the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. Okay. All right.
Welcome to the National Air and Space Museum and to our new Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. I am one of the curators of this new space. My name is Margaret Whiteycamp. I'm a curator here in space history, and we are waiting just in a minute. My colleague Bob Vanderlinden will be joining me, who is my co-curator and who has been here since 1976. But we are delighted to welcome you to this new space that really asks people to think about the ways that aviation and spaceflight have transformed the world. Every day we live in a world that is shaped by aviation and spaceflight in ways that we don't even think about anymore. From the coffee that you drink in the morning and the bananas that are on your table that have come to you courtesy of Jet Aviation, to the weather that you track and the way that you use your GPS to get to your job, which come to you because of satellites, which really only began with the Sputnik in 1957. So we are asking people to think about the science and technology, but also the people, the politics and the power, the business and economics and the culture that is shaped by aviation and space technologies. Behind us, you see people coming into the new Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall, and I would love to take you on a brief tour to show you a little bit of what we have. You'll see behind me, most notably, hanging above me is the Spirit of St. Louis, the actual airplane that was flown by Charles Lindbergh beginning in 1927 when he won the Ortigue Prize. The museum, actually the Smithsonian, sent a telegram to Lindbergh when he was arriving in Paris asking him whether the Smithsonian could have this historic aircraft. Um, and when he landed, he agreed after he had flown it some more that he would bring it back to us. That aircraft was actually lowered to the floor, worked on by the museum's conservators, and then raised back up into its current position. You'll see that below it we have one of the icons of spaceflight, of human spaceflight, the Apollo lunar module. It's obviously it's not, it is both a real lunar module, but it is not a flown lunar module. Those are on the moon. This is LM2, uh, a real lunar module that was built for orbital tests. And the actual orbital test with LM1, with the first lunar module, went so well that they eventually used this one not for orbital tests in space where it would have been lost, but for drop tests. And then it went to the World Expo in Osaka, Japan, before it came to the National League. Air and Space Museum. So this is a real lunar module that has been painstakingly reproduced and refurbished so that it looks like LM5 Eagle, which landed on the moon. So this is part of the system that brought human beings to the moon and back in 1969 through to 1962. So it's a little hard to make out behind me, but above me on the other side of the gallery, we have the X-15, which was, is an airplane that could go as fast as Mach 6, an experimental program run by NASA and the United States Air Force, looking at just how fast you could go in air and in space. The pilots for that X-15 could actually earn astronaut wings for those flights. And in fact, the one that is hanging in this gallery was flown by Neil Armstrong. And in 2008, when Neil Armstrong came to the museum and did a lecture about some of his work, he actually asked us if he, instead of talking about going to the moon, which he had spoken about so often, he actually talked about his X-15 work. As an engineer, he was extraordinarily proud of that. When you come into this gallery, you'll see that it has been reorganized. You'll see actually that our visitors walking through this are walking right up through the middle of the gallery where there used to be artifacts um, in different places. And it now has the artifacts kind of off to each side, which allows us really to bring over 7 million visitors a year through this space. We are one of the most visited museums in the world. And so being able to have things arrayed to the side not only allows us to have a better flow and a better experience for our visitors, but it also allows us a little more space to tell people about what they're seeing. 
I think it's important to remember that when this building opened in 1976, the Apollo missions had just finished in 1972. They were current events. And in fact, even the Spirit of St. Louis, which had flown in 1927, was only about 50 years old. That's the equivalent of remembering something from 1965 or 1966. So when people came into this building during that bicentennial year, they were looking at things that many of the visitors would have recognized and would not have had to have explained to them. Now we have visitors who are coming through who have grown up in a world that is shaped by aviation and space flight. And we need to give them a little more of a sense of what the world might have looked like before that or where those technologies came from. Um, and so this is a place now where we can talk not only about the Cold War context of the space race, but also to show the two missiles that are on the side of the hall and that are a part of showing in demonstration, per the terms of a treaty from 1987, an entire class of nuclear weapons that were eliminated by a treaty signed by President Ronald Reagan and Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev in 1987. So this is a place where we can tell a more detailed story where we can show off these artifacts. And we have both this beautiful multi-story space that houses these iconic pieces of spaceflight and aviation technology. But then also on the other side of the gallery behind me, you can really see that we have this one-story space that allows us to have a more intimate experience. There you will find the studio model of the original Star Trek Starship Enterprise used to film the 1960s television show. And you'll also find some unique pieces that you might not think of. Trophies awarded for aviation and spaceflight and also a set of pottery and porcelain displaying hot air balloons that come from the 1780s, from the very beginnings of flight at all. So being able to tell that cultural story through the enterprise, through the balloonomania memorabilia from the late 18th century, really allows us to tell a story of the many ways that aviation and spaceflight have shaped people's daily lives every day in all kinds of very big ways that have to do with politics and communication, but also that are very much about people's day-to-day -day lives. These are things that have made our universe larger and our world smaller. And we are delighted to be able to bring them to you today. All right, thanks, Margaret, for giving us that, uh, that tour of the hall. And we are now joined by Kevin Murphy and Phil Plate. Thank you guys so much for talking with us. Happy to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. And these guys are getting ready to go in and do a mystery science theater type uh, remake of Destination Moon. Tell us a little bit about what people are going to see in there. Uh, going to see a bunch of grown people making fun of a movie. <laughs> old, old movie. 1950, uh, classic sort of Cold War space exploration, a lot of hardware, a lot of over-explaining of science, and that's where we come in. We're going to try to make it less dry, more moist. <laughs> I think, yeah, wetter. I yeah, it's going to be a moister film than it, than it was the before. The people in the front row are in the splash They zone. will get wet. Yeah. It's like the Gallagher section of yeah. the <laughs> audience there. Now, I heard a rumor that uh, David DeBorkin sent one of you guys like 30 pages of notes about the movie. Is that true? He knows more about this movie than the filmmakers knew. <laughs> true. So he, and he's so excited about this. I don't know. Once he starts, we may not be able to get him to shut up. <laughs> that was that was one of the right things then. we talked about early on about this. Yeah, now, yeah. now you've got a blog that you started a long, long time ago dealing with myths in science. Right. I write the Bad Astronomy blog, which has been around a while, and it's now on Slate.com. And one of the things I, I've done in the past is to make fun of movies, sort of the science in them. Uh, and I used to be a little more antagonistic, I'll put it that way, than I am now. Now it's more like I try to appreciate the movie for what it is, and then make fun of it. It's a kinder, gentler film it's than really it used true. to be. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now, I do have a question about that. Have, have you ever gone in looking at a myth, thinking something was false, and then it ended up being true? 
Uh, yes, and uh, if you ask me for an example, uh, don't. Okay. Uh, this isn't okay. live, is it? We're, we're good. Oh, a little no. bit live. Well, I mean, <laughs> what, what, Look at the time. <laughs> what will usually happen is, is I'll investigate something and then find out there's a lot more going on. It's like, oh, in this movie they showed this, but really it should be that. And then as I think about it more and read about it more, it's like, oh, there's all kinds of interesting science going on here, which is great because then I can write a lot more about it and have a lot more fun with it. Now, I'm a little heartbroken because I've got a picture of me when I was a kid with an egg standing on end on the, at the Vernal <laughs> Equinox, uh, and now I find out that that's not a, not a thing anymore. And, and uh, You ruined his childhood film. I know, I know. It's still a really goofy picture, which Excellent. everybody likes to see. So. My job here is done. <laughs> yeah, that's an old myth that you can only stand an egg on end on the first day of spring or something like that. Um, and I, I've written about that, talked about it many times, and it's, no, you can do this any time. has nothing to do with the Vernal Equinox. But the truth is you only should stand an egg on end on the first day of spring. Uh, well, uh, yeah, except, you know what, and, and this is one of those things where as you do it, it's, and you feel like an idiot while you're doing it. It's like, why am I doing this? And then you get it to stand up, and it's like, oh, my God, I can cool. do this. And then other people, will, we used to do this at, like, breakfast at family gatherings, and I'd see everybody standing an egg on end. It's ridiculous and yet eerily fun. It is fun. My, my brother, I'm trying, my, I'm trying. I look over, my brother's got, like, three of them standing <laughs> up, and, I'm, and I look, and later... He moved, they were sitting on like a paper towel, and I looked, and he had salt underneath it that he had uh, put them on. I was like, you're brilliant. He's a cheater is what he is. He's a little yeah. bit of a cheater. You, but can, you can also like put a little gum on it or glue. There's a lot of tricks, but us old, old style guys, we, we do it just, you know, I, it's just skill. I used to, I used to love, I, I taught for a long time, and I used to love doing egg, 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 egg experiments in my classroom. And, uh, you sound like Vincent Price on Batman. <laughs> oh my gosh. The kids were always oh, excited excellent. about it. <laughs> I'm going to make an exhibit of this. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so now, uh, Destination Moon, going to start here in a little bit. Yep. Is Tom Servo making an appearance? Tom Servo is not making an appearance. We are going 100% puppet free tonight. Nice. Nice. Yes. Now, you do some other puppets as well, right? Well, no. Tom Servo was the puppet that I did long. That's actually the show's been off the air now for. 300 years, I think. 300 years, I think, 300 I think years, to the yeah. day, yeah. And uh, But yeah, I did 10 years uh, being Tom Servo, and since then we've done Riff Tracks, which is the uh, same sort of thing. We make humorous movie commentary. Uh, no puppets, though, just just big, beefy guys about my size. <laughs> I have uh, a chance. <laughs> I have a chance. <laughs> you do, actually. So now, have you ever thought about in 30 or 40 or 50 years, do you think they'll go back and look at Mystery Science Theater and do the same kind of take on it that you guys do to the old movies? I think it'll be an exhibit in this museum. <laughs> I think that'd be great. I think the sat satellite of love will be right next to the Enterprise <laughs> and the Lem over there. I think that would be absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so we do a show for middle school science students. What advice would you give to, to middle school students? Uh, if you want to be popular, don't do this with your phone. <laughs> Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. But you're not in middle school. Yeah. Are you a mom? No. Because, no. you know, that would be a great mom accessory, too. <laughs> my, I think that's my niece excellent. Has picked it, my, my, my niece has picked it out for oh, me. Oh, so. well, that makes yeah. sense. It's very cute. Yeah, thank you. But if you're in middle school... <laughs> I, I think I'll put my phone away now. No matter what happens the next 12 hours, that's my favorite part of the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much for talking with us tonight. We don't want to keep you from getting into the movie on time. It was our pleasure. We really appreciate it, and, and I look forward to hearing the reviews of uh, Destination Moon. Good. Thank you. Uh, Thanks no a lot. No problem. Right Thanks now, we're going to go take a look at Go Flight, the new app from the National Air and Space Museum.
getting was, rid of my, I'm getting rid of my phone. That was so I much just, fun. Yeah, I'm gonna get rid of my Absolutely phone. Absolutely so much it. fun. <laughs> I got to tell you guys, the ceremony outside was amazing. And it didn't rain. It did not I, rain. General Daly was right. I mean, he he actually had the weather timed correctly. Yes. yes. This is a man who's known for for running a tight ship and keeping things on time. Yes. And he said it wasn't going to rain, and it didn't. Yep. And I'm, when I'm a meeting impressed. starts at, at, you know, the ceremony started at 8.30, it started at 8.30 and ended at 9 o'clock on the button. And I, I don't know if it came through on the on the broadcast or not, but to be standing outside when they did that countdown and those oh. shuttle engines lit and it and the sound echoed around the crowd and there were I bet there were five or six hundred people at least out there. Yeah, if not more. and now they're all uh, lined they're, up. They're all so, coming in. And, but we're open all night, so you don't have to get in this line. I think probably around 1:30, you probably just come right on through, no, no problem whatsoever. Yeah, it's uh, that line will probably thin out a little bit. Now, one of the things we want to encourage you guys to do is to tweet about your Air and Space experience using the hashtag Air and Space 40, which you see. Right there, right there. Oh. So tweet with that hashtag. Some of those tweets we're actually gonna be putting up on the interactive wall, which you see back behind us here in a little while. We're gonna go take a, a tour of that, but that wall is incredible because it has these bubbles that float around. You, um, you push on a button and, or a bubble and boom, it pops up and tells you information about an artifact that's on display. But we want to know your stories. If you were here when the museum opened or you had a really great experience here, you know, tweet us about that. Um, we had, you know, I came here as a tourist uh, 10 years ago and five years ago. And I, those are some great memories for me. You know, I've got a picture of my whole family standing over in front of the Robert, Mercur Robert McCall mural. Um, and that's one of my favorite pictures of all time. And then we also have another picture of me standing in front of the space shuttle model in the Moving Beyond Earth gallery. And I kind of have a mullet going in that, <laughs> in that picture. What we need are some of your photos. I know. I think we just need a slideshow of No, of, that, that would get really Marty, dorky really, really quick. Um, now, part of the show that we work on STEM and 30, we get a chance to talk with astronauts quite a bit. Whenever they're in the building, we get to ask them, all kinds of different questions. And one of the things that's been a big topic for us is the journey to Mars. Right. And so take a look at some of our astronaut friends talking about that journey to Mars. Well, you're looking for the signature of life. Because, um, you, you know, there's not going to be somebody standing up going, hi, welcome <laughs> to Mars. So you're looking for things like carbon dioxide that we breathe out, or if it's an anaerobic system, one without oxygen, you might get you know, sulfur dioxide or sulfur-based compounds. There are a number of different things that you could be looking for, and you have to hone in on what's there and then uh, refine it. So it, it, it's an iterative process, like most sciences. <laughs> Well, I was there in space for about six months, five and a half months, and my skeleton, you know, lost uh, a lot of weight. My muscles change, my eyes change, uh, my way of perceiving things change. And, uh, and so we need to understand all this uh, mechanism, the impacts that we have on our body, and we need to make sure that we have the capability of preserving the, the body, the functionality of the body over this long period of time, which is two to three years. We're looking at ways to provide astronauts with autonomy. If I call the ground from the International Space Station, I get an immediate response. But if I'm traveling and I'm near the Martian surface, it's gonna take a long time to get that response. So astronauts and the ground team that support them are going to need to figure out how to deal with those type of psychological issues. Say there's two big challenges. One is the transportation to get there, and then the second has to do with health. When you look at transportation, now we're going 30 million to 250 million miles away depending on how the planets are aligned. Uh -huh. It's a long time to get there. It's a big distance, so we need a vehicle that can get us there. When you talk about health, um, how are we gonna react being in space for that long with the uh, radiation problem? And then we have food, water, all those things that we take for granted here.
Well, we astronauts uh, in space uh, are guinea pigs uh, in a certain way, and one of the way that we help in planning uh, the Mars mission is is allowing the scientists to look at our body and see what happens when you stay in microgravity for a long time. Right now we have Scott Kelly up there for an entire year because we need to push beyond six months if we're going to send someone to Mars. And then what's going on with our machinery? How's the reliability? How's our environmental control system? Is it keeping us alive? Is it breaking down? Do we need to supply spare parts? Um, now we're even looking at 3D printing, which I think is going to have a great application to go to Mars. And so all of it together, it's everything together. It's the human living, it's the scientific research, it's the machinery and the reliability. Whether it be recycling their urine into drinking water or finding ways to break down water into hydrogen to give them an oxygen to give them breathing material, um, and how to, to uh, grow plants in space so that perhaps they can eat their salads that they grow in the spaceship. So it's really important for people to be focusing on the future with recycling capability and ways to eliminate the need to carry big massive things into space. Now, they mocked my phone. <laughs> they mocked the cat phone. But you know what you can do with your portable device, we have a new app. New app called GoFlight, and it allows you, it has some pre-made tours on it, so there's a kid's tour. I'm actually really excited to uh, bring my son and daughter, Bryce and Sadie. Hi, if you're watching. Um, I'm really excited to bring them here and do that tour. Um, and then there are like history tours and science tours and all kinds of different tours. But the coolest part is you can make your own tour. Now, um, this, is, this hooks up with the wall, correct? It does hook up with the interactive wall, so you can favorite things on the wall and then download them directly into your phone and have a customized tour. And the neatest part, you know, you've heard about going down the, the rabbit hole uh, with, with an internet search. The same thing happens here. It happened to us the other day. It was like, okay, you click on this. Oh, I didn't know about that. And it's linked to this. Ooh, what's that? Oh my goodness. And the next thing you know, you've been standing at the wall for 45 minutes and you've got 115 things to go to go look at. So um, it's really um, it's really an exciting thing to be able to come in here. And really, it's pretty stunning when you walk in in the doors and that's the first thing that you see walking in. Well, now the other thing that you see when you're walking in is the LEM. Yes. Or, uh, and the lunar module. And uh, that, not that particular one, obviously, but the lunar module was the part that landed on the moon. The yep. command module was the part that sort of piloted around the moon and picked the moonwalkers up. And we actually not only interviewed Michael Collins, but we have interviewed other Apollo astronauts, yep. uh, one of them being Al Warden. And yep. so let's take a look at what he had to say about his experience with the Apollo program. Hi, I'm Jennifer Lavasser, and we're here at the National Air and Space Museum today in front of the Apollo 11 command module with Apollo 15 astronaut Al Warden. Al was the command module pilot on that mission and did quite a bit of research of his own. Al, can you tell us about what work you did from orbit? Uh, Jennifer, we spent uh, six days in orbit. I spent three days by myself. A significant amount of time that I spent in lunar orbit was dedicated to either taking photographs of the moon, of the moon surface, uh, sensing the moon surface with some remote sensors that I had on board, uh, taking pictures of low light level phenomena such as uh, the Gegenschein and L5 and places like that uh, and doing visual, visual observations of the lunar surface. So it was a very, very busy time. Now you had some special equipment on board Apollo 15. Tell folks about the equipment you had to activate. You didn't necessarily have to do a whole lot with it, but you had to activate it and then do something really special later on. Well, the, the equipment, everything I had was activated in some way. Uh, the cameras had to be extended, turned on, turned off. The spacecraft had to be oriented in the right direction uh, so that the, the, that the cameras actually recorded uh, proper pictures. Uh, the remote sensors, uh, many of them were on long extendable arms that had to be uh, moved out uh, so they could do their job. Uh, the mass spectrometer, as an example, was on about a 20-foot arm uh, that was extendable. Um, so. All of these things took uh, a, a fair amount of planning and in the flight plan, the spacecraft had to be certain attitudes, certain 
uh, devices had to be activated at certain times. Uh, it was a pretty busy time. So you have a very particular first in the space program. You were the first person to do a deep space EVA or spacewalk. Tell folks about how, uh, what exactly you needed to do and how you did it. Uh, well, the extravehicular activity or spacewalk uh, was required because two of the cameras that we carried into lunar orbit, the uh, panoramic camera, which was a high resolution camera uh, that I used to record a up to 25% of the lunar surface, I'm not sure exactly the number, uh, and the mapping camera, which we used to record about 17% of the lunar surface, uh, had film cassettes associated with them that had to be recovered, understanding that the only thing that comes back safely from the moon is what's inside the command module, required me to go out and get those canisters and bring them back into the uh, command module for re for recovery. I have to ask, were you scared at all being out there? Nah, <laughs> nah. You know, it's it's kind of interesting. After you've done it in training a thousand times, uh, nothing is really scary. Uh, getting ready for it, yeah, the heart rate goes up a little bit. But once the hatch is open and you're out there, it's a piece of cake. It's like uh, it's it's like swimming. Um, it's something that comes so natural, uh, very easy to do. As a matter of fact. Uh, that EVA turned out to be so easy that I did it a lot faster than I should have because I really robbed myself of some, some viewing time out there uh, looking at the Earth and the Moon. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure, Jennifer. Thank you. Hi, I'm Al Worden. I was command module pilot on Apollo 15, a lunar flight back in 1971, and this is STEM in 30. Well, now we're joined by Adam Nimoy, the son of Leonard Nimoy. Thank you so much for talking with us tonight. What did you think of the opening ceremonies? I love the opening ceremony. It was very uh, inspirational, and I just feel so lucky to happen to be here in D.C. to celebrate the 40th anniversary uh, of the Air and Space Museum. It's just a phenomenal occasion. Now, you grew up around Star Trek. You know, tell us about, about that experience of growing up around in the world of Star Trek. Well, it's been quite a phenomenal experience, actually. Uh, we never expected it to explode into the phenomenon that it turned into. Uh, back in 66, when the show first aired, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary now in September. Uh, it was a very exciting time for my family. We didn't know what it was all going to be about, but we, uh, we were very excited that Dad was finally on a series <laughs> and had a job that lasted longer than two weeks. Uh, which was a, a, a great source of excitement for us. And we loved the fact that he was doing something that was so out there, that was uh, you know, so futuristic, so science fiction fantastic. Did anybody back then ever expect it to have the, the long life that, it has, that it's had? No, I mean, we really didn't, we knew that it was popular. I mean, it was popular immediately for a while there. You know, contrary to, to, to uh, common belief, Star Trek was a successful series, particularly in the, uh, in the first season. Um, but we never knew it was going to have the impact that it had. You know, my father did not set out to create a pop culture icon. He, he said his objective was to create a rich and dynamic inner life for Mr. Spock. Uh, it turned out that he did such a great job that Spock was, uh, just became an iconic figure for people, representative of so much that people aspire to and, uh, and inspired so many people in the space and aeronautics age, you know, uh, industry. Uh, to get it into careers in those industries. We've had a chance to talk to several astronauts and engineers with NASA that Star Trek was the thing, you know, that, that inspired them. And, and I think that's really neat that it comes from science fiction. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we just, I, I've just completed this documentary film entitled For the Love of Spock, which will be out in the fall. And we interviewed a number of people from NASA and JPL, and they all said the same thing. It was like, their, their first inspiration was Star Trek and Mr. Spock um, because he, he was respected, he was different than everybody else, he was the outsider, yet he was also in a command position when, when Kirk was on the planet's surface. It was a scientist who was sitting in the captain's chair running the ship. And people just loved that. You know, he wasn't in some laboratory downstairs in the Enterprise somewhere. Uh, so it was really inspirational to hear that from so many people who were in the space industry that they were initially inspired by Mr. Spock. Did your dad enjoy getting a chance to meet those people that had been inspired by his character? Absolutely. He spent the, you know, the last 50 years talking to these people, actually. The interesting thing is that you know, my dad was um, always 
meeting with these people who are so uh, interested and enthusiastic about sharing their, their research and the work they were doing in the space and the aeronautics fields, and they would uh, want to lay out all this information to him, and they want, want his feedback and his commentary on how well they were doing. He had a stock phrase, which was basically, you're on the right track. <laughs> um. So what, do you have a favorite story about your dad or, or his interactions on the show or anything that, that you really you know, remember the most about? Well, one of my, uh, I have a number of favorite memories with dad, but one of my last memories, which is something that echoed that had been happening to us for the past 50 years, was when people recognized him finally on the street. And we were in Boston shooting a documentary about his early life, and we were taking a tour. They call them the duck tours. It's a, a tram that drives through town and then just goes into the Charles River, right? And so we're on this tour, we're in the back of the bus, and he's wearing sunglasses and a hat, totally incognito. The, the tour guy doesn't have any clue that we're on the bus. And he's talking about all these famous residents from Boston. He's talking about Sam Adams and John Hancock and Paul Revere and John Kennedy. And then we drive past the West End of Boston, my dad's old neighborhood, and he mentions in the West End's most famous resident, Leonard Nimoy, Mr. Spock from Star Trek. You know, and, and dad and I are sitting in the back of the bus getting a giggle out of this. And after the tour was over, everybody filed off, and Dad introduced himself to the guy who almost had a heart attack. I loved that. I just loved that. He had such an impact on the fans. People just loved him. They loved the character. They loved to meet my dad, and my dad just loved to, to meet new fans. Now, I saw somebody walking around earlier with the Spock ears. Do you see that a lot? I do see that a lot at the conventions, especially because there's so much cosplay that goes on now. I mean, Star Trek is a big initiator you know, and progenitor of this cosplay, and I, and I love it, I really enjoy it. I love it when people, you know, feel so much a part of it that they want to really be more of a part of it by playing that role. Now, do you enjoy science fiction? I do enjoy science fiction. In fact, I was I, just thinking about it this morning in another interview that, you know, my dad was in so much TV in the early 60s that I really glommed onto that I didn't even know he was in these episodes, One of the Outer Limits, I, Robot, about a robot named Adam. I was eight years old watching this show, and there's my dad in a supporting role. I love that kind of thing. Uh, he was in another, I was a big fan of Commander Cody, this guy with a bullet head, helmet, and a backpack that he jumped into the air and flew around hitting up on bad guys. Well, there's these aliens who invade Earth that he's got to deal with, and one of those aliens is my dad, Leonard Neal. I didn't even know this at the time, you know? So, you know, I was uh, interested in, in sci-fi before Star Trek came on. I was a big Lost in Space fan, huge Lost in Space fan. And it's just interesting that it kind of all dovetailed. I mean, Star Trek was, I was a part of the demographic that they were appealing to in 66, and that's why I was such a devoted fan from the get-go. That's, that's really incredible. Um, what, what advice would you give to students? Uh, we, I work on a middle school science show. What, what advice would you, or what do you think your dad would have said to a group of middle school students? Well, the, to let their imagination be their guide and follow their passion. My dad was very, that was a big word in his vocabulary. You have to be passionate about what you do. And, and you should and go for broke, follow your bliss, no matter what it is, and not worry too much about the obstacles in the way. If you feel uh, such a, you know, a, a strident desire to achieve in a certain field of expertise, whether it's math, science, or any of the arts, then you should follow that path uh, you know, and not worry about the competition or all the obstacles in the way. These things will take care of themselves in time. That is exactly the life that my father led. You know, his parents did not want him to be in the arts. They did not want him to be an actor. They wanted, they were Russian immigrants. They wanted their sons to be professionals. And his older brother, in fact, was a chemical engineer, went to MIT and worked for Johnson & Johnson. That was not my dad's calling. And he left Boston at 18 years old to travel three days across country to come to California on his own with nothing. But he was following his passion, and that's what's so important that people understand. Wow, well, thank you so much for talking with us. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but earlier in the year, we actually pulled the Tribbles out of our collection, and we, for one day only, which happened to be April 1st, did a Tribble breeding program here at the museum. And we, we capped it at a day so it didn't get out of hand, but um, here you can take a look at a little video about the Tribble breeding program. Hi, I'm Beth Wilson. I'm one of the hosts of STEM in 30. Today, I'm with Dr. Margaret Whiteycamp, and you have some really exciting news for us. Well, yes. Uh, for the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, the National Air and Space Museum has decided to start a Tribble breeding program. That is very exciting. Now, where did we get the Tribbles? 
Well, we had a few in the collection, and we decided the 50th anniversary was the right time to bring them back. So we've worked with zoos and other animal care specialists to help us figure out the diet. Now, I understand that they can have a tendency to get a little out of control. What, what have we put in place to, to control them? Well, the program will only run for one day. We started at midnight last night, and we are going to end at precisely 11.59 tonight. In the meantime, however, the staff here at the museum has been wonderful, stepping up to take care of these beautiful little things and to make sure that things don't get out of hand. And I understand that you had to put an epic proposal together that outlined research benefits and challenges and that you had to have the director sign off. Well, yes, it was a lot of work but we think it was worth it. Okay, well, my co-host, Marty, is currently with the John and Adrian Mars, director of the National Air and Space Museum. Let's see what he has to say. Thanks, Beth. I'm Eric, here with our director, General Jack Daly. Well. So, General, tell me, what do you think about the triple breeding program? Well, I was skeptical. Uh, you know, I'm not a triple person, more of a dog person, but now that they're here, I've warmed up to these little critters. Matter of fact, I'm particularly fond of this one. I call him Leonard. I, I call mine George. How's the staff taken to him? Well, actually quite well, I think. In the busy everyday challenges of running one of the world's most popular museums, the Tribbles seem to have a calming effect. They're a wonderful work companion. And now we know that there are no Klingons working here. No Klingons in this workspace. Hey, hey, just because the Tribbles don't like me doesn't mean I'm a Klingon. I understand, hey, sir. Hey, get your let's hands go, off me. Let's go to security office. Marty, I think I better go down and see what's going on. It's a good idea. What's going on? Don't worry about it. Do you have a triple? Yes, I call her Michelle. Oh, okay, good. Well, there you have it. The National Air and Space Museum Tribble Breeding Program. And be sure to check out Tribble Camp Live today on our website. It's going to be a long day. At least they're cute. Come on, Tribble. Let's get back to work. All right, we're now joined by Eric Long, uh, Smithsonian photographer extraordinaire. Thanks so much for talking with us. Well, thank you very much. Now, a lot of times when you, when you see the Smithsonian calendar or some of the books or anything about the Smithsonian, Eric or some of his uh, cohorts have taken those incredible images. And you're going to talk to us about a couple of those tonight. Yeah, I'm going to talk to you about one in particular that seems to be an iconic image that that has been used. Hold that a little closer. There. That has been used through, throughout the uh, for, for advancement and for, for calendars. Um, this is this this is the image as you see on the screen. But um, you know, it, it it takes coming up with an idea, and usually that idea comes from somebody asking me, uh, "Do you have a photograph that represents air or aviation history and space history?" that I can use in a presentation. So kind of what I started with was this picture that I took back in 2012, um, if, if you can see that, of the, uh, of the Wright Flyer when it was hanging up in the gallery. Uh, it used to be here in the Milestones Gallery. They moved it into its own gallery uh, to uh, celebrate the centennial flight. But before it moved, I took this wide angle shot of it. And the lighting was beautiful. And, a lot of times I take pictures um, not because somebody's requesting it, but because I see an opportunity and I just go ahead and do it. So, uh, uh, so I took this one and then I had a designer say to me, I'm doing a presentation and I'd really like a, uh, a picture that represents the history of aviation and space. So I kind of thought about it and I said, well, I really don't have a picture like that, but I have a pretty good idea of what to do. So I, one of our, my, my colleagues, was shooting uh, spacesuits out of the Garber facility. I called a conservator up and I said, would you put Neil Armstrong's suit together because I have an idea of something I want to do. So that's when I shot this picture 
of, of Neil Armstrong's suit. Now, what you're seeing here is just a, a chest up shot, but I, I have the full length. But basically, uh, one of the problems in, in lighting anything that's highly reflective like this visor is that you, uh, you end up just seeing the shape of the reflectant. So what I did is I took a, a piece of foam board and I, I curved it. I curved it to the shape of the, uh, of the visor and then I lit the shape. And, and that's what gave me that nice curvature. And you can see, now that you say that, you can see it there. You can see that's... it and, and so, and, it, and it, 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 it shows the shape of it well without giving you kind of a distorted reflection. So I took this image and this image and in Photoshop, I warped the, the right flyer into the helmet. Now, you couldn't really get a shot like this in real life because number one, anything that you put into a helmet is, is backwards, uh, but also you could, never, you could never really get the helmet close enough to the flyer, to the real flyer. So it's been used so much um, because it, it really represents the history of the Air and Space Museum and of aviation and, and space. It, it's one of my favorite pictures that I've seen since I've, I've been here. I, I absolutely love that Well, thank that you very shot. much. I appreciate it. But that's, those are, you know, like I said, this came about because I had already taken the pictures and somebody just said, well, and that's, that's, why I, that's how I'm challenged. Somebody says to me, I don't know if you can get this picture, but this is what I'm, <laughs> this is what I'm looking for. Well, and, and one of the things that I think is really neat is that you really do tell stories with still pictures. Yes. And, and I think that's something that's, that is really cool that when you look at a picture, it's telling a story. Yes. And, and how much do you think about that as you're, as you're working on um, shooting stuff? You know, I, 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 try, I try to incorporate that in the, in the pictures that I take. How is this picture going to be interpreted? Um, you know, composition is a lot and lighting is a lot, but you know, how is this going to be interpreted? Or, Usually when I'm taking pictures, it's always about how is this going to get used? And, and, um, and that's what the, the important thing is, is about taking them, is that uh, they end up getting used by so many different people that you don't even really know how. But um, like I said, this, this particular image has been used by Advancement and by Central Castle, and uh, <laughs> it just sees a lot of usage. Now you've got another one that you showed us, the X-15. Right, the X-15 was what I considered to be my last challenge here, <laughs> well, before they decided to rebuild the gallery. But the X-15 poses a special problem in that it's black, and that it's a shiny black. And it's also hanging from the ceiling. So, based on my knowledge of photography and what I've done in the past, I had a pretty good idea of, of what it was going to look like or what I wanted it to look like. So it required me to um, to hang lights in the ceiling um, and get everything positioned and then go in a cherry picker and take the photograph. And the thing is, is that, you know, when you're in a cherry picker, it's not like you can just go over and move a light. So uh, in this case, that, that photograph really represented a challenge that, um, of trying to pre-visualize what it was going to look like with the lighting that I was using. And the thing about lighting an artifact like this is that um, the lighting is really what defines and delineates the shape of the, uh, the artifact. Uh, it was actually being done for a cover for uh, Air and Space Magazine. So when I, obviously I didn't just take that one shot, I took a lot of variations of that shot. And um, um, of course, this new gallery poses a whole new, <laughs> uh, somebody just said to me today, you know, we're gonna have to do that X-15 shot all over again because of the information desk that's underneath it now. I mean, the whole gallery has changed mm -hmm. around the, the artifacts that we've shot in the past, so. I, every day when I come in, it seems like Eric's out somewhere on the floor taking new pictures of stuff, and I always can't wait to see, yeah. you know, what images you're going you're going to come up with. Yeah. So what's your next challenge? Do you have another one that you've got in mind? Well, one of the real challenges that, that I, I've got to work on is, uh, is shooting rockets. Now the problem with rockets is that they're so tall that by the time you move back, they become really skinny. And even with uh, large digital cameras, large format digital, they still become a, a very small file. So usually what, what I'll end up doing is, uh, I tried it on a cherry picker. <laughs> cherry pickers don't go down. They go this way and then down, and this way and then down. 
So I'll, I'll get on a scissor lift and actually start at the top and come down and I'll take photographs of it as I come down and then stitch them together in Photoshop. Um, that's, that's really cool. And, and uh, at our um, open house at the Stephen F. Udvar Hazi Center, you were set up taking pictures of families just with their cameras, which I thought was incredibly right. cool. Right, and I did that with the Blackbird because really the, uh, the Blackbird poses a whole completely different challenge because it's a, a plane designed not to reflect light. So how do you light a plane that's, not design, that's designed not to reflect light? Well, you backlight it. So I, we had three lights up on the third floor shining across the, the, the back of it. And when you're in the front, then it delineates the whole shape of it. Of course, I had somebody say to me, well, it doesn't look black. It looks white. And I said, well, have you ever been on the ocean on a cloudy day? The water doesn't look blue. It looks like the color of the sky above it. So, um, yeah, it, it, that's one of the things I do enjoy doing is lighting something like that and then taking pictures with everybody's own stuff. So they walk away with something that they would have never been able to get themselves. And that was really neat. You know, right at the end of the day, my son and I were walking out and I handed you my camera and you took one of the coolest pictures of the yep. two of us. And it's it's lit well and it's you've got a great angle on it. and it, you know, it's incredible. So are you going to be doing that next year at the open house? I'll be doing it probably every year. It just seems to be a, uh, 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 well, it's an iconic plane to begin with. And while I've thought about going to other planes, I've had people say to me, how come you're not doing the Blackbird this year? Sure. So, yeah, I'll probably continue to do that. It seems to be a um, always a popular image that people want to have their pictures and take in front of. So make sure you come out to the open house in January, I believe, out at... Uh, Probably the, uh, last year was January, this year was January 29th, I believe, it's a Saturday, it's a, yep. usually the last Saturday in, in uh, the month of January. And it's always a great time out there, Eric's taking pictures, uh, the Stimmen 30 crew had a green screen set up where kids could see themselves in front of the outer space or the space shuttle and and uh, they actually, that's the one day of the year where you can go back and you can see the conservation lab where they worked on the Enterprise model and... Uh, uh, the whole preservation shop is open so you can talk to the guys that actually restore the planes uh, and they can tell you, you know, all the difficulties involved and really the originality of a lot of the planes, the artifacts they find in them and things like that. And they, they will even take you down and show you like the, the power plant and the building and the air conditioning and and all of that stuff. It's really a, a, an incredible day. Well, Eric, thank you so much for talking with us well, tonight. Thank, I, I appreciate it. Thank you it. very, very much. This is kind of a first for me. Um, I'm usually back there behind the camera. I'm never in front of the camera. Uh, now, Eric, this is just a break for Eric tonight because I'm guessing as soon as you're done, you're off to take more pictures. Yeah, actually, we've, we've kind of lit up the Enterprise and, and what we're doing is taking, again, like we did with the uh, Blackbird, we're, we're taking pictures with people's iPhones. Awesome. With the uh, with the Enterprise in the background. Awesome. So, so if you come in tonight, make sure you go over to the Enterprise and see Eric. And uh, we appreciate. And I, I, I got my special ears on tonight. I so, know. You know I just... noticed that. Now uh, we've had a chance to talk to some astronauts about photography actually in outer space. So check this out. Astronaut photography is really inspirational to people around the world because it forms the core of how we remember the space program. American astronauts were taking photographs on their missions from the very beginning almost, but there was no human form involved in those images. There aren't really those human touchstones to form the core of that public memory. With Gemini 4, we see the very first still images of a human in space. Ed White was the first American to perform a spacewalk that becomes iconic of the experience of spaceflight and how amazing it is to finally see people in these images. The cultural legacy of photographs from the Gemini period and the later Apollo period is really about shaping our understanding of what it means to be a human in space. For people who weren't alive during the Gemini program or even the Apollo program, these images are really our way of communicating with that past and feeling a part of it. We may never get to go there, but at least those images are available to us to look and understand and feel as though we can actually put ourselves in the astronaut's shoes. See, Beth, the time is just flying by tonight. It, I'm seriously amazed that it's almost 10 o'clock. I like the way you worked a pun in there already. It's it, 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 10 o'clock, how many puns have you gone through? And uh, how many more are we going to have, Marty? Three or four, but so far they've all been excellent. <laughs> now, the, the one that I was going to 
call out earlier was that, you know, Kevin Murphy made fun of Beth's cat phone, but don't worry, that's not a catastrophe or anything. It's, you know, you'll, you'll get past that. Okay, <laughs> we still have a lot of people coming in. It's, it, it's, it's a, a steady, steady line yeah, coming in. It really this is, is. You know, I mean, we, did, we didn't know how people were gonna react to the museum being open all night. And there was, there's always that fear of, is anybody gonna show up? Right. Well, they are still coming in. It has been a steady line for an hour now. Yeah. And it doesn't look like it's gonna stop anytime soon. No, it doesn't. But the nice thing about the new milestones of Flight Hall is that they've opened up this space. Yeah. So that when you walk in, you have a big open space that you uh, can come into. Uh, and and just the, the walls there, you can figure out what you're going to do, map it out. Uh, there's we just... have a brand new uh, welcome center that's that's uh, kind of back behind us, and and we have the the docent tours start there. And I, I want to talk about the docents for a second. Sure. Um, our docents here are absolutely amazing because not only are they they well trained on what they're giving tours about, but they are truly experts in their field. Many of them are pilots. Um, I know we've got a couple uh, docents that were pilots in Vietnam. I know we've got docents that work in the aerospace industry currently and then come in on their weekends and, and do yep. things. Um, for one of our STEM and 30s about space junk, we actually talked to a docent who, do, who works on rocket trajectories to get through the field of space junk or, orbiting the Earth and deciding is this safe or is this not safe and and, and we had we also had uh, an SR seventy one Blackbird pilot on who you know flew the plane knew the plane inside and out was able to give us history and great stories yep uh, and knew you know I, I was just amazed at his knowledge uh, on that airplane well and we'll actually meet him later in the night. Uh, we did a, a walk around the plane, which was incredibly cool. So it was myself and, and Buzz Carpenter, and we actually crawled under the plane, right. and we're looking at the, there are gaps in that plane as big as my finger to account for the thermal expansion when it gets up to the, the incredible speeds that it has. And we talked about the special tires that it had to have, and so we'll be showing that, that later tonight. And he was, again, it's, it's our docents who, you know, can really, Take you through and, and give you really special stories. Uh, they they have a lot of connection with the museum and the artifacts that are in here. And so during the night, we're also going to uh, have some, some of these docent tours. Yeah, and and speaking of those connections, we want to hear about your connections. You know, the the hashtag is on the screen all night long. Air and Space 40. And we really do want to hear your story. You know, send us a picture of you when you were in second grade and you came and visited the museum. Um, send us that story about your grandpa coming in and saying, I flew that one. Um, you know, we really want to hear those. And one of the cool things you can kind of see back behind us, you've got the picture of, uh, of Buzz Aldrin on the screen right now. One of the things that this interactive wall does is it allows you to submit those um, stories and those images with the hashtag Air and Space 40 and after tonight it'll just be Air and Space and we can actually put those up on the wall and, and share those stories with all of the visitors and I can't wait to really see that get started. And that wall is just just neat as can be. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you, can, you can pick your own tours, uh, you can learn more about the artifacts uh, and it's, it, it's very user friendly. You can you know, it, it, we're going to hopefully have a, a conversation yep. uh, with Vicki, who helped develop and that the, wall. Um, it's very intuitive as well, and, and it was nice because I'm a little bit taller than my four-year-old son, but he came in during one of the previews the other day and walked up, and he was immediately able to figure it out, and, you know, we had to read some of the stuff to him, but right. he's hitting the buttons and, and really enjoying that experience, and all the way up to people, you know, just random visitors can make that connection here. And then again, the other thing we've done in the Milestones of Flight Hall is to put video of, of the artifacts uh, and the people associated with them. And the stories, uh, you know, you can look at an airplane and uh, know all the stats and how high it flies, but if you can, 
you know, hear an interview about, with someone who, who's flown it yep. or see how the artifact work. Uh, it, so it's not just labels anymore, you yes. know, so the, it's, it's a lot more interactivity. Well, and the video that we just watched is one of the videos that goes along with the app and, and, and with this whole new experience in the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. And it's, it's really exciting to be here tonight because they're still coming in. I yes, mean, they are. It's, it's really cool, and, and I can't wait to see all the people going in to see Galaxy Quest at midnight and 2001 after that. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's a lot of fun here tonight. And we have a, a lot of things going on, and we have arranged to have food trucks. Now, you can't, you can't bring the food into the museum. No. So if you decide that you want a snack, uh, you'll have to go out and um, actually eat outside. And they, they do have some tables set up undercover. Uh, so if it is raining, you can go out and, and be undercover and get your food truck food, eat it, and then come back in. Um, the, uh, the projection that they had on the wall during the opening ceremony um, is still going. We still have some content that's, that's going on up there. One of our digital wizard, wizards, Matthew Horton, um, created a lot of those videos that you saw during the opening ceremonies, and, and they were just incredible. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm excited for people to get a chance to come in and experience this. We've been seeing pieces of it you know, for the last two months. Right, right. But to see it finally all come together is just, is, is really cool. It is, it's, and I think that um, it's taking the museum in the direction that, uh, that we want to go. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of renovation over the next couple of years. We will be open the whole time. Uh, but all the, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about moving objects around, and uh, it's just, it's gonna be and, a lot and, of work. And not little objects yeah. either. <laughs> we're talking about moving some of the largest objects in our collection, and not just moving them, but flipping their orientation or, or moving them around in a gallery. I mean, we're really talking about some, some major transformation, but it's gonna make the visitor experience just really come to life when you come in here. And, and I think it really will, you know, when the museum opened, this was this was still modern history. I, I mean, the, um, Michael Collins was the first director. Uh, he flew on Apollo 11. When people came in, they they, they knew these objects. They, yeah. were, they were still it in. It was a current event. It was a current event. <laughs> and now we have to, uh, you know, give it, it, present it to a different audience who, Expect something else. Yes. So I, I think that as we move forward, um, I, I think it'll be. It, this is just the start. Yes. And and for me, you know, coming into a museum like this, but particularly here, and getting a chance to go up and see the real thing, is right. is incredibly cool. And here, and I, I I don't know exactly where they put it. I heard it was moved down here to this hall, and I haven't seen it yet today but they've moved the moon rock down here. They, they have. Actually, the moon rock is now with the lunar module. Okay. So it, 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 they, I think that everything is, is ready. We're, we're open. We're, we'll be here all night. And um, so, and so, um, so we are a live show, and uh, you never can tell who's going to come by. So uh, right now we are going to kick it over to a... Uh, video with our director, the John and Adrian Mars director of the National Air and Space Museum, uh, General Jack Daly. Aviation is America's story. We went from the first powered controlled manned flight to walking on the moon in 66 years. The Air and Space Museum shows you exactly that history. Everything that we have has a special significance to the development of aviation and space in this country. I came and saw this aircraft. I remember it so well as a small boy. My father explaining to me what it was. It was the first airplane to ever fly. Here they are in the same room uh, with the airplane that the Wright brothers flew. One of the main purposes of this museum is to preserve these artifacts forever. Sure, you can have reproductions or mock-ups, but here you have the real thing. Everything that's in here has a story of great significance. It did it first or better than anything else. 
and you have to stop a little bit and think about the story as you view the object. I always find something marvelous, something that completely surprises me. The Discovery Space Shuttle is so significant and it is so quintessentially Smithsonian. This is the shuttle that has inspired a generation to realize the importance of space flight. Our mission is to commemorate, educate, and inspire. But it's wonderful to see the, the young people come in here and be inspired by things that have happened before and uh, maybe be inspired to do a little better in math and science and technology in their schoolwork. It's so important for young people to really get a good education in STEM. They see what has been accomplished in the past, and then they think about, well, what can I do? It really changed my life. It changed my direction. It helped orient me along the path of becoming a scientist. Who knows what you will be inspired to be the next person on Mars. Space exploration should continue. The Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum is more than just a collection here on the mall. It's inspiration. If we can inspire, then we've done everything else right. And now I am joined by the John and Adrian Mars Director of the National Air and Space Museum, General da Jack Daly. General Daly, thank you so much for being here tonight. My pleasure. Um, could you tell us uh, about some of the new and different uh, exhibitry that we've put in the milestones of hall flight uh, the, the milestones of flight hall well it's important to point out that the milestones of flight really do it contains the icons of the collection so some of the uh, artifacts that were here are still here but they've been augmented by this display right behind you which is the first two uh, jet engines built one by the Germans and one by the British. So it's, uh, and the other, th perhaps more important thing about uh, this whole entire gallery, of course, we have the lander, the, the lunar lander, which is our centerpiece now. And it, since the gallery has opened up so completely, and, it, and we have more of a theme flow. So the visitor gets on a, on a subject or a theme and, and it works where they can go around, uh, kind of move around the uh, gallery and and uh, it kind of makes sense to them, I think. Now, this is just the beginning. We, we're we going to go under some renovation, and, but we'll stay open. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about what to expect while we, while we start uh, updating the building itself? You know, that's exactly right, Beth. This is the beginning of the beginning. And the, I think it sets the model for the way we're going to go with the additional 22 galleries that we still have to do. But it's a new way to communicate with the visitor, to, to pass knowledge and to pass information, uh, and to perhaps um, spark some interest to where we develop a relationship to, that they so they'll stay in touch. Because now we have uh, capability to communicate that we didn't have before, and we also have a great deal of information available through the digitization that's been taking place. And so it's a vast, uh, you know, toolbox, I guess, of, of information that we can actually share with the, with the world. And the thing is, they don't have to be here or talk to us. They can get it themselves mm -hmm. because of the, the accessibility that this gallery and others will provide. Now, I, I know this story, but I want our viewers to hear it. Can you tell us a little bit about one of your favorite objects that's in the museum? Which one? The one the, that your father... Okay, yeah. <laughs> Well, we have in the Sea Air Gallery, the current uh, gallery, we have a Boeing F-4B-4. And uh, I was very familiar with that airplane, but when I got here, and I, I went in my father's logbooks and found that he had actually flown this exact airplane the year I was born. So you, you have a connection here that you just found out once you started working here. Yeah, that's right. General, I know that you're busy, and this is a big night, so I want to thank you very much for taking time out to talk to us this evening. Well, thank you, Beth. Okay, this... have a good evening. Okay, see you. Thank you. 
Happy birthday. 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 Happy 40th birthday. Happy 40th birthday. Happy 40th birthday. Thank you for inspiring me and my fellow astronauts. Congratulations. Congratulations. Congratulations on 40 years of excellence. Keep inspiring those generations of future space explorers to aim high and reach for the stars. Congratulations to the National Air and Space Museum on 40 fabulous years. Happy birthday to the National Air and Space Museum. NASA wishes you many more decades of inspiring the next generation to reach higher and explore. Keep empowering those kids to live their dreams. Happy birthday, National Air and Space Museum. I came to Washington sneaking up on 1976 and I used to run around town saying, museum on the mall by the bicentennial. My name is uh, Mike Collins, uh, at one time was in the space program on Project Gemini and Apollo, which you know is the first flight to the moon. Then after that, I uh, was lucky enough to be director of of this museum, the National Air and Space Museum. So many of the things that are in it, the artifacts in it, are old friends of mine, and, uh, and, and some of them uh, way before my time. We were supposed to open uh, July 4th, 1976, and we actually beat it by three days, July 1st, 1976. Uh, we were uh, supposed to cut the ribbon out here, the ribbon on the mall side of the building declaring it open. The signal came from a spacecraft between here and Mars in outer space. And uh, I was holding my breath, you know, I was thinking all those electrons gone lost up there in space and all these VIPs standing around looking at this ribbon and this mechanical shearing device and nothing would happen. But Believe it or not, all the electrons did their cute little things and the ribbon got snipped and the building got opened. It was, it was good. At the peak of the Apollo program, when Neil Armstrong stepped out onto the surface of the moon, that I think was kind of the peak of the interest that the American public had. Buildings like this do a lot to sustain that level of interest and, and, and that's one of the things that I think is very important about this beautiful surrounding, the National Air and Space Museum, which is a vital part of the Smithsonian Institution. And now I'm joined by uh, Richard Paul, who, now you got interested in a, in a particular aspect of the space race. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. You know, presidents of the United States, they come into office, you know, after the campaign, they expect they're going to do whatever it was that their agenda was, and then life takes over. So President Kennedy gets into office. The, 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 the Soviet Union sends a rocket up into space, right. and now the United States is completely behind. Bay of Pigs happens right after that. And President Kennedy says to Vice President Johnson, go make something happen in space. <laughs> so May 5th, Alan Shepard goes into space. Nine days later, the Freedom Rides start. And African Americans ride in the front of the bus, whites in the back of the bus, a group of young people drive down south to start to stick a thumb in the eye of Jim Crow segregation. May 24th, President Kennedy makes his speech saying we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. The next day, the bus gets firebombed in Henniston, Alabama, and a week later, mobs riot around the bus in Alabama, and the governor declares martial law. And all of a sudden, President Kennedy is thrown in with both feet into the space program and civil rights. And my book, our book, my, myself and Stephen Moss, uh -huh. my co-author, the, the book is about 
the African Americans, the first African Americans in the space program, people who were so dedicated to putting a human being on the moon that they didn't care that they couldn't use the same toilet as their coworkers. These are people who went to work in the space communities in Florida, Alabama, Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, the heart of the Deep South, segregated South in the 1950s, the 1960s, and all of the sacrifices that they had to go through just to do their science and their math and to help put a man on the moon. Now we should mention the title of the book. The, book is, the title of the book is We Could Not Fail, the First African Americans in the Space Program. This is the paperback, which will be out in um, a month, I think. Okay. The hardcover is out, but this is the book. And I was fortunate enough to get um, a fellowship, the Verval Fellowship here at the National Air and Space Museum, and spent a year working on the book. My, my co-author, Stephen Moss, put in a ton of work about 20 years ago, um, broke all kinds of ground. I found his work, I'm a documentary producer, and I found his work when I was doing a documentary on this subject, and then we got together and decided to write a book and uh, Margaret Weidekamp, who is uh, one of the curators here, and Roger Lanius worked very hard to um, enable me to get a fellowship here. And I got to see your smiling face <laughs> every morning in my office. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I love it. Do you want to with. tell us one of the, your favorite stories that, that you said? I mean, I know there are, this is a great book, by the way. And, and I read it while you were writing it and have reread it as you know just a reader and there's some really compelling stories is there one that sticks out for you you know Clyde Foster is such a remarkable character we had him here yes. at the museum back in uh, 2010 he was um, he came to NASA before it was NASA he was a, a school teacher which was a, the highest thing that African American an African American professional could aspire to mm -hmm. in the 1950s he was a school teacher I uh, had gone to school at Alabama A&M in Huntsville, Alabama, which is the black college in Huntsville, Alabama, and went to Selma to teach and hated it down there because segregation was so awful. His wife got an application to NASA and got him a job at the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, was before it was NASA. So he goes to work at NASA. And in 1963, when Werner von Braun was having his arm twisted by the head of NASA and by the Attorney General and by the Vice President, to try and hire African Americans in Alabama at NASA. Clyde Foster knew that Alabama A&M University had just gotten a computer, its first computer, <laughs> and nobody knew how to do anything with it. He had worked at NASA, he knew how to work with computers. So he went to help the college um, learn how to use their first computer, and he got this idea. If we could get the kids here at Alabama a and black kids, to learn computers, we can get them jobs at NASA. So he does, he starts the first computer uh, class in the state of Alabama, trains up hundreds and hundreds of African American young people who learn computers, uh -huh. they go to work at NASA. Then, at the time, he wanted to advance in his career. He was being held back because he was black. Um, he said, I want to be a supervisor. I want to raise. I want a better job. And at the time, NASA had advanced training. You had to take advanced training if you wanted right. to move up. The advanced training was only held at the white university oh. and in hotel lobbies where <laughs> African Americans were not allowed to go. He pushed and pushed and pushed and got NASA to create a separate but equal <laughs> training program for blacks at Alabama A&M and trained, that trained African Americans who are now able to get raises and become supervisors at NASA. And then, <laughs> on top of all that, he discovered that the little all-black enclave where he lived had once been a town. He went to a judge, got the town reinstated as a town, <laughs> got himself elected mayor. He was one of the first black elected mayors in the United States. <laughs> and he says all of this happened because of NASA. His story is just amazing. Now, did they have 
trouble convincing African Americans to move into these communities? It was. I mean, what, was it a, were they put in these communities on purpose, these, these government agencies? Well, Vice President Johnson believed that if, if the space program was in the South, you could create all kinds of new jobs and number one, change the economy of the South away from agriculture and uh -huh. towards technology. But also, he thought that if you could create jobs that were new jobs, then nobody could say, the Negro can't do that job because nobody had ever done that job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Johnson wanted to find ways to get African Americans to come to NASA, but it was easier said than done. One of the things that I found out in doing research for the book is that NASA would send white recruiters to black colleges. And these white recruiters would tell these kids, oh, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. They knew it wasn't going to be fine. 1971, NASA hired its first African-American recruiter, a man named Charlie Smoot. And there were people who Stephen and I talked to for the book who said, I wasn't going to believe anything those white recruiters told me. Oh, sure. But when Charlie Smoot told me it was okay to move to Alabama or to Florida, I knew it was okay to move to Alabama or to Florida. So the, the space race actually helped race relations in the United States. I'm sorry, you said that? The, the space race really helped, you know, to advance yes, race th relations. And, and this is, yes, it did. And in a way that... I mean, it's not bragging to say had never been told before Stephen did the research mm -hmm. that he did. No one had ever made the connection between the space program and civil rights, despite the fact that they were both happening at exactly the same time. He was actually told by his, his supervisor, he wrote it originally as his master's thesis, and his thesis supervisor said, if there's a story here, somebody would have written it already. <laughs> you know? And, we dug and we dug and we dug and we found these people and we found these stories and were able to tell a story that had never been told before. The first African Americans in the space program. And again, the name of the book is We, we Could, Could Not, Not Fail, Fail. The and First African Americans in the Space this, Program. This is a paperback version. It's coming out very soon. Mm -hmm. Richard, thank you so much oh, for God. joining us. This I, is it was so, so much good fun. to see you, you again. Too. Really um, great. Now we're going to watch a little bit about early flight. The Soviet Union launched Sputnik Thanks. because both the United States and the Soviet Union were competing to demonstrate to the public that they had mastered this new World War II rocket technology. The only way to prove it is to actually make the satellite orbit the Earth, be able to track it, and that was the beginning of the space age. On the Soviet side, they had a plan. Months before they launched Sputnik, they publicized the frequencies on which the satellite would be broadcasting a signal. And that was how the Soviets were able to tell that the satellite had achieved orbit and where it was. Radio amateurs throughout the world could tune in and listen to the beep, beep, beep of Sputnik. The public at large was shocked. For the first time, humans had demonstrated that they could send something into Earth's orbit. America's response to Sputnik was of great concern. Had the Soviets overtaken us in technology? And were they demonstrating to the world that they had greater capacity than we did? It spurred on a lot of economic spending from the Defense Department to develop the technology that would be necessary to overtake the Soviet Union in rocket technology, space flight, and navigation technology. The Sputnik satellite itself lasted only for a short period of time. It came back and burned up in the Earth's atmosphere in late January 1958. The Sputnik that you see here at the museum is a model presented by the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Sputnik is at the Air and Space Museum as a symbol of the beginning of the space race, where we could talk about sending humans into space. And I actually have Dennis uh, Kuzak, is that correct? That's correct. And, and you were just visiting here today. Uh, for the reopening yeah, of the right, milestones right. of flight. Yeah. But you have a really great story about, about your father. Why don't you tell us this story? Well, I was here in uh, the original 40, uh, 40 years ago for the opening, and my father is a retired uh, restorator here, and he uh, helped me with many others to restore the spirit of St. Louis. And each one of their restorators received a, a piece of the fabric, the original fabric, in a frame, 
and I, uh, we have that at home. That is right really, now. that's great. So you're, you're here visiting your old friend again? Oh yeah. <laughs> and then it was, last week I got a call from a gentleman from the Washington Post who said that while they were cleaning it up, they were pulling up floor panels and they found a note that my dad had left back in 1975 that, um, so that I, they, so it was, it's in the Washington Post. And it's, one of our conservators who we're gonna hear from later actually found that, that note. Oh. And uh, it, 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 it's really, it's another nice connection uh, right. that, that shows the care that people have taken in, in restoring these. Now you have some really great photographs. Can we take a look at these? Sure. And you want to tell us a little bit about what's going on in this one? Well, actually, this one uh, is out at the Paul Garber facility in 1980. And these are the 17 left of the original Baba Black Sheep, uh, Pappy Boeington. And uh, they're out in front of, they're in front of a, uh, an F4U that was restored. And I believe it's uh, hanging in one of the museums now. It's probably out at a, the Uvarhazi Center. Right. Let's take a look at, and you've got this one as well. So let's take a, I think I know some of these people in this photograph. Yes. These are, that's, of course, my father's right there in, this, in the middle. And, uh, of course, there's uh, Michael Collins and a, a few of the other, my dad's co-workers and restorators uh, well, receiving an award from Michael Collins. Thank you so much for sitting down and talking with us oh. this, this evening. Oh, it's been I, incredible. I, I, I hope was you... here. And it, it was like we took the metro here. It just opened up in, in uh, 76. So, six. Yes, so it, it was like a, you know, riding a Disneyland, <laughs> you know, Disney ride. And then you got here. to come here. Right. So and all... now you're back again 40 years oh, later. Yeah. And hopefully, yeah, many years to come. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much for joining you. us today. We're going to take a look at some of the restoration that was done on the Spirit of St. Louis. Whenever we start with, uh, with any sort of project, um, before we lay hands on, on an artifact, we try to do as much historical research as possible to really anticipate things or, or look for you know, particular historical clues about an artifact once we start working on it. So whenever we started the cleaning, we made sure that we weren't going to be stripping off any original materials or uh, colorants off the flags. Um, so we, uh, we started going through, and at first we were sort of shocked. Uh, because it was such a dramatic transformation. You really were starting to see the engine turn decoration was coming out. Um, and we, uh, we contacted Bob right away and let him know that, you know, we're getting quite a strong before and after uh, result here. But we've, we've confirmed by comparing our UV photography from before the cleaning and during the cleaning that basically all the original materials were just taking off dirt and grime. So what you see now is a much more vivid interpretation of what the original markings would have looked like back in the time period. Uh, you can still see some of the light yellowing that's from the original coating there, but uh, now that all the dirt and the grime has been removed, the colors are more vibrant in the flags. Uh, the engine turning, I said, is, uh, is much more vibrant. What'd you use to clean it? I love we, this. <laughs> we use just water. Water on cotton swabs and slow and gentle cleaning. So it was a very tedious process, but um, because we're dealing with original surfaces, uh, the last thing you want to do is any sort of mechanical cleaning or any sort of polished compounds at all, no strong chemicals whatsoever. Uh, the fact that we got such a dramatic cleaning with just straight up water was really quite a thrill to, to all of us. And now I'm joined uh, by right Jeanette Davis and her son Kyle York. Thank you so much for being here. Yes. Now you have, Jeanette, a very interesting story. We do. That you can tell us. We and do. I'm just going to let you go ahead. I'm not, I'm not even going to set it up. <laughs> uh, well, Keith and I are thrilled to be here because we are relatives of the Wright brothers. Um, I am the great grandniece. Keith is the great great grandnephew. And a lot of people want to know how does that work? How are we related? And uh, many people don't know that Orville and Wilbur had two older brothers. Right. One older brother's name was Lauren, and he is my great-grandfather. And uh, Wilbur and Orville did not get married and have children, so the direct descendants of the Wright brothers are 
the nieces and nephews. And how do you feel about being able to see the plane here? Um, I choke back tears. <laughs> it's really cool, especially now that it's down on the floor and everybody can see it. Um, Keith and I were just kind of up there wandering through, listening to people talk about it, um, have them be in awe, uh, talk about what geniuses they are. It's, it's a very surreal feeling. It's a very surreal feeling, but it's wonderful, and we're so thrilled it's there, and it's such a centerpiece of the museum. And, it, and it's highlighted that we have a bicycle on loan from the Henry Ford. Yes. Because they were bicycle makers. Bicycle mechanics, and, absolutely. And you can see that connection uh, between bikes. I mean, you can see the bike parts on the plane, which is I've always found very interesting. That, absolutely. That there was, they not only were they great, you know, they were very smart and uh, great inventors, but they also look back to the technology that they were already using. Yes, they did. So, and it made sense to them. Right. It made sense to them. I think as a relative, that's one thing that really strikes me, as they thought about it a lot, but it made sense to them. Right. And they weren't afraid to question some of the technology that was out there and the way that people thought at the time and, and proved that it could be improved upon. Sure. Now, Keith, you have a great story, too. Why don't you tell us what you just graduated? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I actually just graduated from the University of Southern California in uh, astronautical engineering. And um, so I was really set down upon that path uh, because when I was 13 years old, it was 2003, and that was the 100th anniversary of the Wright Brothers' first flight. And so, you know, as a 13-year-old kid, I got to come here and see the plane and meet people. Um, and in Kitty Hawk, uh, in December, they had the big week-long festivities. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to meet uh, Neil Armstrong and John Glenn and uh, another astronaut I actually went hang gliding with on the dunes of Kitty Hawk. <laughs> and so, you know, as a 13-year-old kid who was already a little bit of a nerd, you know, I was already <laughs> kind of, I liked the math and science to begin with, but then to meet these just you know, pioneers, like people that have done things that had never ever been done before. It was, I, I, I don't get starstruck anymore because <laughs> I've met the, you know, some of the greatest humans ever. And so that, that really set me down the path uh, that I, that I'm on. And so, you know, I completed my degree and uh, I'm studying astronautical engineering. And, you know, my, my hope for humanity is that we continue to just push the boundaries and do what my great, great grand uncles did. You know, they, they got caught by the bug and thought flight's something that could be possible and work towards it. And uh, I think that that new frontier now is space. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's the Air and Space Museum we've got that, that we're in right now. And, and I think space is that new frontier. And that's really where I want to lend, you know, my talents and my efforts is to, to pushing the boundaries of humanity and space. Yeah, I know that you've spent a lot of time in this museum as well. Yeah. Uh, other than the Wright Flyer, what do you find inspirational? <laughs> uh, I, I, <laughs> being a space guy, I got to say the, the the capsules from uh, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. Those are just really, like the Apollo Eleven capsule. Just seeing that is amazing. It's super cool. And uh, one of the things that I had to do while I was here was go touch the moon rock <laughs> because I mean it's it's just phenomenal that, that humanity's been able to do that and I, I hope we go back soon and I would love to be a part of helping people go back or be one of them myself and uh, you know I've been saying since I was 13 that I, that I want to go to Mars and uh, I think that you know now we're really starting to gear up towards that as, as a country um, not only through um, the funding of like the Orion spacecraft and, and um, the space launch system but also things that uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX are doing to try to get there on the private sector. You know, I really believe that right now we're in the golden age of, uh, you know, human spaceflight. Um, and some of it's even private. We have Spaceship One. Right. And that, I mean, the hope is, is that, you know, we'll all be able to take these little trips in, in low Earth orbit. Now, I have to tell one of my favorite Keith stories, <laughs> uh, because I have known you all for 12, 12 years. years, and uh, shortly after I met you and, and Keith at a conference, I think I was in Seattle. I believe so. Um, 
I said, well, if you're in town, give me a call and I'll see if I can't uh, get a tour of our spacesuit collection. And at the time you could do that. So I took Keith and his younger brother uh, into the, um, where we keep the spacesuits. And uh, our curator was very generous and had us all put on white gloves. And then she passed around uh, a booth that Harrison Schmidt, who was the only scientist and one of the last people on the moon, had worn. And I, I was holding the booth and I thought, I'm holding a booth that's been on the moon and I'm standing next to one of the relatives of the Wright brothers. I don't think this job is going to get any better. <laughs> and that's it has. Right. <laughs> it's awesome. gotten better and better and better. Um, awesome. Are you guys enjoying this evening? Absolutely. It's it's amazing that there's still lines, lines of, people of people. I know. I know. Still and filing in. Yeah. It's it's ten thirty and and they are they are still still coming in. And the looks on everybody's faces and the looks on the kids' faces and that's amazing to me too. Watching it on a night like tonight. I mean, no matter how many times you come in here, you see something. You're in awe. You're so close to it and. The new displays and everything that's new is fabulous. Well, uh, it is, as General Daly said, it's just the beginning for us. Uh, and um, I am so glad to be spending this time with you all. Thank you so much for coming out. Absolutely. Oh, we're happy Thank to you. be here. And we hope that when he completes his mission, we hope you're still here. Oh, so well, that that's he can great. Hand yeah, it yeah, to yeah you. That's, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll have you on. Uh, we'll collect your spacecraft. Uh, it may be out at Hazi. It's getting a little cramped in here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you all so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, let's see what's next on tap. Engineering the right way. On this site, you can step into the shoes of the Wright brothers. You can design the wing shape and size, then travel to Kitty Hawk to test your glider. Some of our friends from Ball State University took a crack at flying the right glider. Let's see how they did. Nice job, guys. All right. You will be able to design an engine, propellers, and ultimately pilot the Wright Flyer Simulator. But if you're going to get your plane into the air like the Wright brothers did on December 17, 1903, you'll need more than a steady hand. You'll need to solve difficult aeronautical problems and prove your engineering solutions through rigorous testing before taking to the air at Kitty Hawk. Do you have what it takes to be an aeronautical engineer? Find out with Engineering the Right Way. They showed up just at the right time. <laughs> and it's only I've been 10, standing over there it's waiting. It's only 10.30. <laughs> I'm going to be here until late in the morning. Fortunately, you leave earlier than I do, so I'll have an hour of peace. Exactly. So one of the things that um, we've, we've talked about a couple times tonight, but I, I want to tell the story again because it's, it is truly one of the highlights of, of my time here at the National Air and Space Museum is uh, a couple of weeks ago, they do, a, they do lectures here at the museum. And, and so the Glenn Lecture is one of the biggest ones during the year. And Michael Collins gave that lecture. And so not only was he um, on Gemini 10, Apollo 11, test pilot um, and then he worked you know he was the first director of this building and worked on getting it opened in time um, incredibly nice guy a very nice guy and we got an opportunity to to hang out with him for about four hours while he was here and it was he was so nice and and we we both did interviews with him we filmed some stuff that you saw earlier um, but one of the really cool things was we did a chat between General Daly and you know uh, Michael Collins, and and it was just really cool to see them 
talking about their experiences as the directors. Yeah, and because, you know, Michael Collins had a, a big job getting all of this open, and General Daly is going to have a big job getting it all updated. Yes. Uh, so I, yeah, the chat was, well, I mean, let's take a look. All right, yeah. check it out. Good morning, I'm Jack Daly, the John and Adrian Mars Director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. And we're here at our Moving Beyond Earth Gallery and have the privilege this morning to have uh, the founding director of this museum, Major General Michael Collins, United States Air Force, retired. We're gonna have an opportunity to discuss some of his experiences in opening this museum and also where, where we're pointed for the future. And we might just start with that, Mike, if it's okay to uh, you know, you were faced with uh, getting this place open. In fact, we say you were responsible for it, but you didn't necessarily have all the authority you needed to make sure it happened. <laughs> and, uh, but you were racing a deadline to have it open by the bicentennial of the United States. Exactly. Yes. And uh, I've heard some stories about, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you, John, Don Lopez told me that you had a paintbrush the night before the museum opened and you were touching up some areas <laughs> around uh, uh, that's essentially true, yeah. It was a photo finish uh, to get the museum open by the 4th of July, 1976. I think we beat it by three days and opened on the 1st. Uh, when I first came here, it was in the uh, early 70s, and at that time this, uh, this museum was just a vacant lot. Um, the Congress had, uh, had authorized the creation of the National Air and Space Museum, but they had not appropriated any money for it. So my first job was to, uh, thanks to people like Barry Goldwater, I think he was probably the, the number one asset at that time, was to run around town saying, yeah, it's a fine idea, but now where's the money to do it? And, uh, and then the money came and we converted money to a big hole in the ground and we hired a first class architect and we started Filling it up and building it was a uh, very interesting time and a very interesting project to see something like this actually take shape and become real. Don Lopez used to emphasize with the picture of the opening ceremony with President Ford out there yes. getting ready. Yes. And everybody was smiling, having a great. You were standing back there looking at your watch, <laughs> waiting for that yes. signal to come from yeah, Mars. Yeah, that's cut true. It. That's so true. That's I was nervous that day. Also, it was timed, I think we had the, um, not the Blue Angels, but the Thunderbirds, I think. Yeah, we had the Thunderbirds fly over, and that had to be timed with the snipping, and, uh, and we had all these dignitaries who were going to make speeches, and I thought, oh, God, they're, none of them are going <laughs> to stay on schedule. They're all going to go overtime, and uh, yeah, the, the, all of a sudden, the, the robot will snip the, Ah, the whole thing was just a, a mess, but it worked out all right. Everything miraculously fell into place. Well, we're going to try to reenact that on the first oh, no, of July. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> not with the robot and not with the scissors, but with the signal, uh -huh. because we're on the first of July, we're going to have an all-nighter here at the museum. Yes, I understand. That That's a wonderful idea. We'll start with a brief ceremony, very brief, uh, where we talk about what we're doing and why, and then... Uh, We'll all be outside, hopefully, if it's not, if not raining. And then when the signal arrives, the lights will then come on in the Milestones of Flight Gallery. Great. To kind of s we Great. can't match your show, but it, we're going to come pretty close, I think. Sounds like so it. So we're looking forward to getting, uh, we're, we're aiming this at uh, a little different group. When they first came up with the idea, I said, no, we're not doing that. Staying open all night. And they finally, for the second time they came in, they said, you know, you're not the target audience. We're trying to get some young folks in here, so uh, <laughs> and they like that kind of stuff, yeah, so let's yeah, do it. Yeah. And that's uh, and so we're looking forward. Yeah, to Yeah, if you can keep their thumbs out of their little <laughs> gadget while they're spending <laughs> the night here, then we'll good turn luck. off the Wi-Fi. Maybe they'll All keep right, up okay. paying attention. You know, there were there was some serious doubt on individuals and, and groups, I guess, about whether a museum that only dealt with airplanes and spacecraft would be of interest to the public. Well, of course, there's a human side to it. Uh, there used to be anyway, now we have drones, but <laughs> uh, you can't have the uh, Bell X-1 without having uh, Chuck Yeager. And uh, we tried to portray not only the machines, but the, uh, the ideas behind them, the science and the technology of creating a machine and problems with its operation and 
the, 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 the human aspect of exploration is, of course, key to all of it. Yes, well, I think they, those who doubted were soon proved wrong because you got the first million visitors in, the, in 25 days. Oh, I'd forgotten that. that. Uh, I'm told uh, this year it's going to be 8 million uh, visitors, I think, to this museum. We used to say that uh, th th this was the most uh, popular uh, building on Earth in terms of visitation, except for Grand Central Station in New York, and those poor people had no choice. They had to <laughs> go into the building to get home. But uh, of people who were voluntarily uh, entering a building, this was building number one in the world. Well, as of the end of uh, calendar year 15, 327 million people have gone through this building. Oh, my Lord. So uh, it's ready for some revitalization, and, uh, and we have some plans going for that. Well, no, I'm impressed by the interior and how the exhibits have kept pace with the progress uh, that uh, our country and the world has uh, done in, in the last 30 years in terms of advances in aviation and space. You know, if one of the, you might be interested in, the, the fact that it was underestimated as to how many visitors would actually come into this building. And so I guess you had to immediately modify some of the men's rooms into ladies' rooms because <laughs> of the traffic. Well, I can tell you- Those we, are good problems to have. Well, they are. No, yeah. they're great. Except that when a couple comes to the uh, visitor's desk and you say, well, sir, you're down here and madam, you're down here. <laughs> well, we've just two years ago corrected that. Oh, we good, now have good. got them both together. So it yes, took a little while. You probably avoided a lot of emergencies that way. <laughs> and, uh, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the, uh, we are, it, it, the building's 40 years old and uh, it's been scheduled uh, for a revitalization of all the mechanical systems, yes. uh, which have reached there. All the warranties have run out, by the way. I, I guess so. So it's, uh, we're gonna have to start over with some of the uh, air conditioning and the plumbing and the electrics. But while we're doing that, um, we have an opportunity to also transform some of these galleries that uh, have been icons for years. And uh, th with the purpose being to uh, find a new way to communicate with the visitors. And as you mentioned, be careful of electrons, but that's one of the ways that we see it as possible because most people who come in here have some sort of a device and we now can hook them, we hope, to go for more information mm -hmm. and then to stay in touch with us, which is what we're really looking for. So it's, uh, you know, when you started uh, in the labels and the way things were presented, and, and we don't, by, by the way, we're not gonna change the information because it was valid then and it's valid now. It's just the presentation which will be a little different. Well, you have to keep up with the times electronically and, and in any way you can. Uh, I look around, uh, one of the very nice things is it's all neat a, as a pin. It's wonderfully maintained and uh, there's a freshness to the exhibits. So the, it indicates they're being turned over and modified and uh, kept up to date. So uh, I, I think it is just a beautiful uh, environment, just as it was on opening day. And now all these years later, it, it's still that way, maybe more so. Well, I really I appreciate you saying that because we're very proud of it. And we've tried to maintain it to the standards that you established mm -hmm. when you opened. I think that uh, it's uh, this museum is starting really kind of its second 40. And uh, only, although uh, one of the surprises we got when we did the engineering analysis for the revitalization was that the stone cladding is going to have to be replaced. So I understand, yes. Uh, it's had, uh, it's warping and cracking. That's why we have those covered walkways around the, uh, yes. the building. I, I think uh, we probably should have made the stone or acquired thicker stone or stone was, I, I'm, I'm really not sure of the technicalities of marble cladding, but uh, anyway, yes, uh, I'm sorry to hear that it has to be replaced, but I'm sure once it's over and done with, it'll go on, it'll be great. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll try to get a 60 year cladding for the there next one. There you go. <laughs> the, uh, and one of the things that, and you would appreciate this because you've had to endure it to, during your tour is, uh, we're gonna stay open while we revitalize this building. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a moving uh, kind of a wave come down from the west end to the east. 
And uh, when does it start? When it, does it end? Well, we actually have started. We're okay. in the we're in the planning phase.